I'm calling this meeting to order. The Charlottesville City School Board has convened a closed session on this date in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of, of Information Act. Therefore, be it resolved that the Charlottesville City School Board certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this cert certification applies. In only such business matters as were identified in the motion, convening the executive meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Right. Mr. Chair, I have another motion. Um, I move that we decline Almar County Public Schools offer to purchase uh, Charlottesville City Schools interest in KTEC in that pursuant to the 1969 agreement, we exercise our right to purchase Almar County Public Schools interest for 5,300,000. We direct the law firm of Royer Karamanis to act as counsel for Charlottesville City Schools and respond to Almar County Public Schools. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. I would like to read a statement at this time. I would like to take a moment to explain the vote that was just taken. Because it concerns a real estate transaction, it was discussed in closed session before our meeting. Based on this vote, Charlottesville City Schools will assume sole ownership of the KTEC or the Charlottesville Albemarle Technical Education Center. This will allow us to ensure students continued access to valuable career and technical education, part of the city's larger vision for workforce development. You may recall that in the fall, Albemarle County Public Schools announced their intention to end this 50-year partnership. In December, we received their formal offer to purchase our one-half interest in KTEC for $5.3 million. According to the original 1969 partnership agreement, Charlottesville schools then had the option to either sell our half at that price or purchase their half at that price. So tonight, the Charlottesville City School Board voted to purchase the Almar County Public Schools stake at that same price. Charlottesville City Schools believes that the scale and scope of technical education are best supported by the joint effort of the two school divisions. To be clear, our first choice was to continue operating jointly, but after the Almar County Public Schools announced their decision to end the partnership, continuing jointly was no longer an option. And Almar County Public Schools has previously made it clear that under its ownership, accommodating city students would not be a priority. The question for this board was, therefore, whether to assume ownership of the program and protect Charlottesville students' access to these vital opportunities. And that is what we have decided to do. I would also like to say that we intend to continue to operate the facility as a regional resource. There will be many conversations with Albemarle to work out this change in leadership, but we are committed to a smooth transition for KTEC students and staff. We value this incredible community resource and look forward to continued success for current students and a bright future for this important school for many years to come. Now, before I get to the moment of silence, I would like to read a statement.
On behalf of the board and Dr. Gurley, I would like to acknowledge that the toll that gun violence is taking in our Charlottesville community. Sadly, this is not new, but it still needs to be said. I encourage us all to reflect on what we can do to put an end to this senseless loss of life to those especially in our Charlottesville schools family who are grieving loved ones lost to gun violence. You are in our thoughts. So let's pause for a moment of silence. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Chair, we do the roll call of the board members. Mr. Chair, Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Present. Ms. Dooley. Here. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. Torres. Yes. Mr. Morris. Yes. Ms. McKeever. Here. And our student rep, Ms. Wong. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Clerk. At this time, I need a motion to approve the proposed agenda. I so move. Second. Discussion. I thought we were going to talk about some of these issues, not board response to written reports. Was there some, did we move any of those up into the regular uh, information agenda? Okay. So 10.3. We left the written report and we made a presentation. Okay, thanks. So All in case, favor? Aye. All Aye. opposed. Now we will have comments from the community. And I have a list here in front of me. And we will start with Miss Jessica Taylor. And then I will pivot to Zoom after everyone has spoken in the room. Please state your name and your address and please give your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Okay. My name is Jessica Taylor, 1016 Hayrake. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Dr. Gurley, members of the board. I've worn this shirt to several board meetings over the past year, but the words speak to a deeper truth tonight. Being a public school teacher in Charlottesville, in Charlottesville has taken on a more significant meaning because of what we, the CEA, the educators of this school division and you, the members of the school board and our superintendent have chosen to do. Being a public school teacher in Charlottesville now means that for the first time in over 40 years, we will have a determining voice in topics that impact the work we do, which in turn directly benefits the children and families of this city. It means that over the next few years, we will show other districts across this Commonwealth just what a commitment to excellence via compromise and collaboration truly looks like. We have worked hard for this moment, and I am proud to have been a part of this process. I truly believe that the people who do the work in schools and with the children deserve a voice in the development of the rules and processes that govern that work. It just makes sense, and it is long overdue. 
I am hopeful that our union brothers and sisters in Albemarle will soon be afforded the same elevation in participation and respect by their employers as we have been here in Charlottesville. The CEA appreciates and wants to publicly thank the school board and Dr. Gurley for being willing to work with us through some difficult discussions to get to this point. We particularly want to express gratitude for the press release yesterday in which you have already announced your intent to vote in favor of the collective bargaining resolution at the March meeting. Over many years, I've had the privilege of educating hundreds of students in this district. And while each of those children has left their own special imprint on my heart, today marks one of the proudest moments I have had as a Charlottesville City Schools teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. We now have Dave Koenig, Koenig, excuse me. You got the original German, correct, Mr. Bryan? We say Koenig now though. <laughs> Good evening, my name is David Koenig. I'm a history teacher at Lugo McGinnis Academy and parent of two Greenbrier Reading Stars. I'm not gonna talk about collective bargaining today, maybe just a little bit at the end. But mostly I wanna speak about standardized testing and Max Hill. Mr. Hill is our science teacher at Lugo. He's a good old boy from Texarkana, and he's also a good old teacher. Mr. Hill doesn't seek conflict or controversy. He is content for the most part to come to school every day and do the challenging work of educating some of our city's toughest students. He cares deeply about our kids and their future. I've seen him put his heart and soul into his work on a daily basis. And for that reason, although Mr. Hill was not someone you would expect to speak out publicly on political issues, on Friday of last week, he took a half day of personal leave to drive from his home in Stanton to Richmond to meet with his delegate and others in the Virginia legislature and lobby for changes to the regime of high stake standardized testing that has been allowed to continue in this state and this country for too long. Before he went to Richmond, Mr. Hill spoke with the other Lugo teachers to get our thoughts on the SOLs. All of us agreed that if we had our way, we would abolish the exams altogether or at least remove them as a graduation requirement. These tests are a creature of the billionaire funded education reform movement and serve mainly to generate profits for testing and consulting companies. They are an affront to teacher autonomy, but most insidiously they continue to be used to rate and shame schools with large numbers of students from marginalized communities and to punish at risk students like ours at Lugo. Short of abolishing the SOLs, Mr. Hill asked members of the House of Delegates to at least consider some reforms to the system. Could the test be designed in a way that would truly test students' knowledge of a course's subject matter, rather than their ability to spot the test author's tricks and clues? Or at the very least, could there be a robust set of practice exam questions so that we could more effectively prepare our students for the exams? There have not been any questions released for Mr. Hill's biology exam in almost 10 years in the name of test security. Now, while I admire Mr. Hill for putting himself out there to advocate for our students, I also can't help but think that one teacher spending a half day speaking to House of Delegates members is not likely to have much impact, especially when that advocacy conflicts with the preferred policies of the standardized testing industry and the hedge fund backed ed reformers. It takes more than individual action, it takes collective action to force changes to unjust but entrenched systems. So in closing, I guess I would like to ask three things of three different groups. First, to my fellow teachers, Let's use our right to collective bargaining, which this board has announced they will recognize next month to advocate for educational justice for our students and to fight against policies that we know are harmful to them. Let's see this as an opportunity to begin to raise our collective voice and let's organize in any and all ways that we can to challenge injustice in our schools. Second, to Dr. Gurley and members of this board, you have been leaders in taking strong stands on other policies that threaten to harm our kids. You have stood up for the rights of transgender students and against the whitewashed history standards that were proposed by the Yunkin administration. High stakes standardized testing is harmful to students as well. Please consider joining with your teachers to speak out on this issue. Finally, to the other parents who are here tonight or listening in, my wife Liz and I decided that we would opt our kids out of their SOLs in elementary and middle school 
because we refuse to participate in a biased and harmful system. Now, a handful of families opting out won't change anything, but an entire community opting out just might. Let's talk about this in our PTO meetings and our advocacy groups and our neighborhood listservs, and let's act together for educational justice. Thank, thank you. Ms. Jen Horn. Hello, um, Jen Horn. I teach English and public speaking at CHS. And I, I had a long prepared thing when this whole process started, but today I just wanna say thank you. And I wanna say that I am excited about the future of teachers and staff members and through them students becoming a more collaborative part of the process here at CCS. And I also want to thank our CEA leaders, Jessica and Shannon, Dave, the people who have really been at this for 12 months every week. Um, so thank you and thank you. And I'm excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Laura Hamani. Good evening. My name is Laura Imany. I live on Jefferson Park Circle, and I have a fourth grader and a first grader at Jackson Via. I'm here this evening to speak in support of collective bargaining and would like to thank the board for their support. My children have had amazing teachers at Jackson Via, and we love being part of the community there. However, several of their teachers have moved on from Jackson Via. Retaining good teachers is so important for building our school communities, and I believe collective bargaining is an important step towards improving teacher retention. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Tanisha Hudson. Good evening. So uh, first and foremost, Mr. Bryan, thank you so much for your statement. However, I don't think that we need to just focus on the outside community. We also need to focus on the school community. CHS is out of control. Buford ain't too far behind it. Lisa, while I appreciate you putting your name in the head for city council, baby, you got to worry about what's going on here. You all moved extremely fast on a volleyball issue when black girls felt like they were discriminated on by the coach. But you can't move fast on the conditions that are in, your, in, in the walls of your schools. The fight that happened last week could have been avoided. You had staff members that knew about it, that heard stuff. You have an attendance staff member that lets kids out of school. I, I set up my own nephew to go check out of school. He was able to check out with no issue. They never once called my sister, never once. I'm even on the list. They never even called me to say that he could leave. I did it on purpose. Uh, the HR lady that's doing the investigation, I don't know what she investigating. If it's that easy for me to find out how simple it is for kids to just walk up out of school, I don't know what, I, I don't know what anybody is doing, but I will say this. Safety is needed and necessary in school. A six-year-old shot a teacher. All those people wearing those red shirts back there have every right to feel the way that they feel walking in here every day to teach. They feel unsafe. If you're not trained to break up fights, you shouldn't be standing behind a girl holding her by her neck, letting other people hit her. You should be trained to be able to stand in between both students that's getting into an altercation or you don't do it at all. You got people who are not mat trained, breaking up fights. They shouldn't be breaking up fights, but they are. And what they're doing is holding one child back while five other kids are able to hit on that child. It happened last year, it wasn't right. It happened again this year and it wasn't right. It's not okay. No matter how y'all paint the picture, here we sitting here having arguments over what to name a school that you didn't agree on. On what to name a school, you, you can't even control the school, the conditions of the school. And why I agree, that it needs to be accountability on all sides, parents, students, as well as staff, support staff and everyone. We do have to start with what you all are enforcing or choosing to enforce of your staff members. 
Because if you're not enforcing them to do their job in this entirety, then a lot of stuff is slipping through the crack and it's not okay. Number one. The last thing that I'm gonna say is this. When your staff complains that somebody is not listening, I know my time up, give me 10 more seconds. When your staff is complaining that they're not being heard, you have a problem. And you have a problem in this school with staff feeling like they're not heard. You have a problem with staff going to leadership and saying, look, a, a student just told me they was gonna smack the you know what out of me and nothing is being done. There's no threat assessments being done. Parents are not being called. That's not okay. Y'all have to do better. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Yeah. Well, our next speaker is uh, Shannon Gillifan. Hi, I'm Shannon Gillikin. I teach at Jackson Via, and I am a proud CCS parent of three kids. Um, tonight, I, I do want to take a minute to thank um, all of our CEA building reps, our amazing president, Jessica Taylor, and the many members who have spent countless hours this past year organizing. Thank you to everyone who came early, stayed late, spent time having conversations, providing feedback, and helping us best represent staff. So much of organizing is done behind the scenes, so I want to recognize all the staff that have gone above and beyond to get us here. I'm really thankful to you, our school board, with your intention to move forward with collective bargaining that will ensure that our staff continue to be supported as we work with our city's most precious resource, our children. You all know I'm a kindergarten teacher, so I'm gonna leave you with a number story. 10, the number of months since we proposed our resolution. 72, the percent of employees who sign cards authorizing collective bargaining. 987, give or take a few, the number of meetings and emails that got us to tonight. 28, the number of days until your next school board meeting where you approve collective bargaining. And seven, the number of yes votes I hope to see at that meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Belinda Bullock. Hello, oh, I uh, decided this morning to do this. And um, as most teachers, I thought I might get a little bit of time today to look over my notes, but I did not. So I'm gonna do my best. Um, I am very excited about the collective bargaining. I am actually going to be um, retiring after many years of teaching this year. But I have seen, a, I, I work at Jackson by I'm an ESL teacher there. Um, in the six years I've been there, I've seen a huge turnover in teachers just at my school. They have all been fabulous teachers. Um, and I do feel like um, they did not feel heard. They did not feel in control. Uh, there was a lot of fear of speaking out. Um, and coming from a larger school district, I was very surprised. And uh, I do feel like one of the issues is that you're in a really nice city that a lot of people wanna live in, so you're easily replaced. But replacing a experienced teacher is not really uh, benefiting the children or anybody. So that's just my what I have noticed. Um, like I said, very excited that we are moving forward to collective bargaining. I hope that that will really help the teachers uh, retain teachers in the school system because we deserve it and the kids will benefit from that. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say about the collective bargaining, I think I think a lot of you know that the teachers are working long days, but today's a great example. You know, we were all at the school at least at seven o'clock, if not earlier. We had, our school had a staff meeting afterwards, um, very little planning time during the day. And I live too far away to go home. So, you know, I have been here and I'm getting old and it's a long, long day. And it would be really lovely to know that I had a voice in some of the things that, uh, that we could control more of what's going on. So I appreciate that. And um, just wanna thank you again. Thank you. Ms. Michelle Euton. Good 
Good evening, Dr. Gurley, members of the school board and friends. Uh, my name is Michelle Yaten, and I live on Cedar Hill Road in the little pocket of the Greenbrier School District behind World Market and Best Buy. My husband and I have two beautiful children who are here, and um, a son at Buford and a daughter at Walker. They have spent their whole lives in Charlottesville and have learned from the most loving and knowledgeable teachers the city has to offer, and we are very grateful. I'm also one of your teachers who recently transferred from a role of being a classroom teacher at Greenbrier Elementary School to my dream job as a reading specialist with a newly named Summit Elementary School. I come to you this evening to talk about three points. One, on my way to school each morning, I drive by the intersection of East High and Hazel Street, where I see one of our beloved crossing guards, Mr. Kevin Cox. After the recent heart-stopping news coverage by CBS 19, which showed a SUV barreling through his zone, I stopped to chat with Mr. Cox one morning on my way into Summit Elementary School. He shared with me that several members of the board had reached out to him via email um, at, you know, when I did that, and he was grateful, and so am I for that, so thank you. My ask is that we find ways to provide consistent and robust help for our crossing guards and ultimately our precious students. He is one of many outstanding people serving our community in the pouring rain in extremely dangerous and sometimes hostile environments. On a side note regarding Mr. Cox, he likes coffee. So if you ever make the time to visit him in the morning, just a fairly little tip. Two, I'm excited to hear that the Buford Athletics Department has secured a grant of $5,000. As we brainstorm ways to use the grant, I hope that either now or in the near future, we provide an opportunity for our youth to play on a soccer team. With the current pay-to-play model in our town, organized soccer is out of reach for many of our most talented players, which have often have origins of a rich, diverse cultural background. By providing our students with a school option to play early, they would have a chance to break into organized upper levels in high school and beyond. Besides future opportunities, a school-based soccer team would be a giant win for another healthy and vigorous engagement for our students. And finally, three, I would like to publicly thank our CEA president, Ms. Jessica Taylor, for her tremendous leadership, as was announced yesterday regarding the commitment from the school board to vote yes for our collective bargaining. We are overwhelmingly joyful and excited for our next steps. I am grateful for Jessica, Shannon, Dave, and Becca's energy to focus, to absorb, and navigate on behalf of their friends this past year regarding collective bargaining. For all the building representatives and folks I'm unaware of, well done, and thank you as well. And for you school board members, thank you for agreeing to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. I am grateful to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sayana Bryant. Good evening. Um, so I have three things I want to talk about. The first being um, African American studies curriculum. So Governor Ron DeSantis, who is doing absolutely foolish things on the national stage around African American studies, um, I think invites us to reflect on our own um, ways of cultivating that sort of education here locally. When I was at CHS, which was, well, a very long time ago, uh, <laughs> um, we did not have an AP AAS studies course. Um, I know that there were some conversations about making um, an honors credit course, and I believe that those things have been implemented since I've left. Um, however, I do think it's important for us to think about how we can diversify our syllabi. And I do remember being in AP Lang and AP Lit and not seeing many black scholars. Um, so I think it would be great if we would take a look at the list of scholars that were banned from that course by the college board and maybe implementing them into our English courses here, especially in 10th and 11th and 12th grade. Um, and I will follow up on that. Um, another thing that I wanted to speak about was comprehensive anti-racist policies that cultivate more inclusive classroom environments. I think that the fights that we're seeing here at CHS are only, you know, the surface level symptoms um, of deeper root problems. Um, so one being the wage gap, another being a lack of representation of black educators here at CHS and across the district. And I don't think it's very, um, I don't think it's a, a pull factor um, when we see 
there are some great teachers here who are lobbying um, for their right to have agency. However, I would be remiss if I didn't speak on the ways that Black women educators have been historically taught within this, treated within this district. And we know that it's not good. Um, aside from not being treated well, they're not elevated. We constantly see Black male principals come in as head principals, but not Black women. And I don't think that it's encouraging um, at all for any students who graduate through this district and want to come back. I've spoken to some of my peers who are now going to be graduating in May along with myself, and they absolutely will not come back um, despite being excited to teach and wanting to pour back into their community. So I think it's important for us to think about that. And lastly, I wanted to talk about how we support Black girls within our district. I see that we're having haircuts for Black boys. I see that there are ongoing initiatives every year um, through Black Male Achievement and through our Youth Opportunities Coordinator in the city. However, I feel like Black girls are constantly missed. What can we do about that? Well, I'm not sure, but we have plenty of professionals here who are paid a great salary to work on that issue. So I would like to hold the board and the district more accountable to think, our, uh, to think about our black girls because as we see these fights, it's not just black boys. Gun violence does not only affect, affect black boys um, and the constant just shadowing of black girls um, is not helping and it's not gonna make our district any better. So thank you so much for your work and I hope you take these things to heart. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? Uh, good evening, board members, Dr. Gurley and Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Bart Isley and I'm an English teacher and football coach at Buford Middle School. I'm here speaking in support of the addition or the consideration of an addition of $5,000 to the Buford Athletic Department budget. Providing a place for young athletes to play sports with fewer barriers to entry is instrumental, instrumental to creating a healthy school environment. This year, at Buford, we had 38 student athletes come out for football, including two female student athletes. The vast majority stuck with it, despite the fact that football is, without a doubt, hard. Uh, I saw a student from our new Pathways program flourish on the field. I watched student athletes that struggle in the classroom succeed in practice and in games, helping build confidence that hopefully will car eventually carry over into their schoolwork. With help from an entire community of team moms, assistant coaches and administrators, we were striving to provide a safe space where student athletes could come together and pursue improvement and success on the field. We all know the challenges some of our students face, and this is an incredibly important program for keeping kids attending school regularly and opening the door for improvement in all aspects of school life. For some kids, it was the reason to come to school. And while we want them to come for more than that, football is the kind of opportunity that opens the door for more. If they're not there, that door simply isn't cracked open. With the expanded budget, we can do more across the board in athletics at Buford from upgrading safety equipment and training. Uh, for instance, we didn't have a blocking sled this year. It's hard to teach blocking without a blocking sled. Uh, and that's a critical training tool. We can also continue to help instill a sense of pride in both the program and the school at large. We'll do that while building confidence and creating better equipped future scholar athletes here at Charlottesville High. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. We have anyone else who would like to speak? Please come forth and state your name and address. Hi, Krista Bennett. I'm a parent of a Jackson Valle student and a CHS student. As a parent, I just wanted to add another parent voice to say thank you so much for your commitment to pass a resolution for collective bargaining. As you all know, Virginia ranks 49th in the, in the nation for teacher pay when compared to our average state pay. And I'm so excited that Charlottesville can be a leader in, in making change and, and showing how it's really done. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Emily Hien. I'm a Charlottesville resident. I live on 506 Ridge Street. Um, and I wanted to um, thank you for your um, commitment to collective bargaining. And I know this has been a very long process and um, I really appreciate um, all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Como, do we have anyone on Zoom with the hand raised? Oh, Mr. Brady, okay. Few words real quick. How y'all doing? Melvin Grady, um, Charlottesville resident, born and raised here, went to school here in 1986. Uh, I know all you all talk to your children, everything else. I don't know speak like this. I just work in the trenches and get the work done. Two things, uh, about three things. First off, thanks for your commitment to the collective bargaining resolution. I'm glad that's happening. Um, and that means you, you buy your teachers. Um, the 
the brawl, the fighting going on. I saw a video at my school. When my student, I work at Luke McGinnis, by the way, math teacher, Luke McGinnis. Student showed me a student, one student holding a uh, phone, another student like, you ready? He hit the student. No fight was allowed. He attempted to get on the uh, floor. Then he picked him up and said, brush yourself off and, and like, you better not say anything. And like, it's never happened. In the bathrooms, by the way, I recommend, okay, for our safety wise, work on the areas where things can happen, okay? I don't care who's doing it. As Mr. Hudson said, we gotta work on this healing process. Parents do a better job, but until they do, students stop fighting, but until they do, we gotta work on the healing process. It's not just breaking up the fights. I wish I was here, honestly, Mr. Pitt. I wish I was here just, just to be around that so I can stop it, but that won't do it though. The kids have a lot of trauma. They're on their phones, they're beefing. You know, it's, it, they're triggered real quickly. So I'm not saying discipline, hammer down, but we gotta find a way to, with the healing, because that's a serious problem. My daughter's 14 years old, she was in North Carolina. I'm not sure I wanted to be here. That's scary to say that. I love Charlottesville. Taught at Buford for 10 years, two now Luke McGinnis going on. I could be here, by the way, with no problem. Serious talk, but I can't be everywhere at one time, but I can't say the word, I'm not trying to, but trying to do one at a time though. And one more thing was the, uh, the $5,000 for Buford. I coached track at Buford, sometimes by myself. Y'all give me a $500 stipend, you know it's a joke, but it's no big deal because I love the kids. I was asked by Anna Jones, um, you gonna come back to do coaching? I was like, I don't know, not the money, but just the time commitment. Of course I will for the kids. I may have like 40 kids come out. More than football, by the way. We need some t-shirts just for like track basic stuff. So I hope you approve the $5,000 for the kids at Buford, they need it. And I appreciate the work you're doing, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raider. Is there anyone else before I go to Zoom would like to speak in the audience? Thank you all for taking your time to come out to speak to us tonight. Ms. Como, is there anyone? Um, no, I've left a message for people to raise their hands if they'd like to speak in the attendees gallery, ask them to raise their hand, and I do not see any hands raised at this time. item on the agenda is um, student and staff recognitions. Dr. Odie. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped over there. Next item um, is um, public comment on the budget. Do we have anyone who'd like to come forth and speak? We'll move to student and staff recognition, Dr. Odie. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening. You may recall that at the January board meeting, I mentioned that over the past several years in Virginia, we have celebrated our wonderful principals. You see them there during Virginia School Principals Appreciation Week, which occurred during the week of January 15th through the 23rd of this year. Now that we have received Governor Yunkin's proclamation officially recognizing that week as Virginia School Principals Appreciation Week, I wanted to put that proclamation before you. So if you could put the proclamation up again for us, please. We'll look at those beautiful principles again in a moment. Now, while I won't read every word from the proclamation, it is important to note that we have outstanding principles here in Charlottesville City Schools. As you probably know, a school success is largely determined by the effectiveness of its principle. Decades of research has made this clear. There are five things that I will highlight that effective principles do. One, they must have instructionally focused interactions with teachers. Two, they must work to build a productive and positive school climate. Three, they must facilitate collaboration around instruction and maintain high functioning professional learning communities. Four, 
they must strategically manage personnel and resources. And finally, effective principals must always bring a lens of equity to their work. And their equity-oriented practices are key in working to close achievement and opportunity gaps. So if we bring the principals back up again, I hope it's not too much trouble. We just wanna look at them. Our Charlottesville City Schools principals do all of these things and more. They inspire students and staff each and every day to be the best that they can be. So we are excited that they are officially, officially recognized by the governor for all of their hard work. We absolutely appreciate them. And here you see them, make sure that you celebrate them, make sure that you thank them because they deserve it. And I would love to give a big round of applause to our principals for all that they do. And now I'll continue if that's okay, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to take a moment to recognize our amazing school counselors. Next week, February 6th through the 10th is National School Counseling Week. This is a time to focus public attention on the unique contribution of school counselors within United States school systems. National School Counseling Week, sponsored by the American School Counselor Association, or ASCA, since 2011, highlights the tremendous impact school counselors can have in helping students achieve success and plan for a career. School counselors serve as a first line of defense in identifying and addressing student social and emotional needs within the school setting. They have unique training in helping students with social emotional issues that may become barriers to academic success. One might ask what the most important attributes of a school counselor are. Topping the list would be empathy, discretion, patience, compassion, and encouragement. Then come qualities like self-awareness, open-mindedness, and flexibility. Our CCS school counselors possess all of those qualities and are so important in shaping the future. We have a former school counselor before us in our board chair, Mr. Bryant, and he possesses all of those characteristics as well. Please be sure to celebrate our school counselors next week and every week for all that they do for our students. And if you wanna give them a round of applause as well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Chuck. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members and Dr. Gurley, thank you for having me here this evening. I am here to recognize the people in front of us, our school board. And uh, again, there is a resolution. I do uh, encourage folks to read it, but I am not going to read it tonight. Instead, I'm just gonna give a brief listing of a couple of the topics and issues that you all have been working on just this week. Our state has been considering a history curriculum to which you all, I regret to tell you, unsuccessfully lobbied for a more diverse and inclusive curriculum earlier today, they did decide to advance the other curriculum. Um, let me get my list back open again. The 1% sales tax for school construction. And again, I regret to tell you that that was tabled in the house, but it is not dead yet. There's still hope, but that is another topic this week alone that you have been working on. The consideration of school names to evaluate whether our schools reflect our current values. That is another topic that you all have been working on this week. The uh, acquisition of KTEC to assure career and technical education for our students. That is a huge issue on which you all have been working this week. 
And then uh, I don't know how many folks here are still here to, uh, to encourage you to finish the job on collective bargaining and to thank you for your commitment. But that is another huge issue that you all have been working on just this week. So those are five things, and I could probably list another five or 15 other things. But I want to thank you because uh, we see the work you do each and every day. Um, and I that now, now I've got Mr. Bryant on speed dial, but uh, just a month or two ago, it was Ms. Torres on speed dial. And um, I just appreciate all the work and support that you give to our schools and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chuck. And uh, Ms. Thacker and Ms. Green are showing you a token of appreciation, a tasty token. So uh, we hope you'll enjoy that. We like, uh, I would like to acknowledge Ms. Jennifer McKeever. Please charge her to her head and add to our hearts. We admitted you out of the picture. Okay. <laughs> Someone acknowledge Ms. McKeever on the end. Dr. Odie, you're up again. All right. So we have one more recognition uh, this evening. Last, but certainly not least, we want to take a moment to celebrate our clerk and deputy clerk, Julia Green and Leslie Thacker, right there. These ladies deserve to be recognized and celebrated for the vital role that they play in assisting school board members, the superintendent, and the school community as a whole. School board clerk and deputy clerk appreciation week is February 13th through the 17th. So it's coming up soon. Uh, and we certainly want to appreciate, uh, we're going to appreciate them then, but they really deserve to be appreciated every week for all that they do to make schools and our division run smoothly. Often, they are the glue that holds things together. So we just don't know what we would do without them. From answering calls from the community to directing traffic. And our ladies have just certainly proven that they are all in for Team CCS. So please take some time to celebrate them now, but also especially during their special week. Thank you so much, ladies. And I have a token for you if you would come to get that. Again, thank you, Dr. Ori, for those um, recognitions. And we do want to, again, thank our principals, counselors, school board members, and our clerk and deputy clerk for all the great work that you do and all the wonderful teachers. So now I need a motion to adopt the um, consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. All right, um, now we are to our action items. We do have uh, Dr. Odie who will come up. We do need approval of um, policy IIA and IIAB, the instructional materials and supplemental materials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening again. Uh, last month, in January, I presented the draft of the rev revisions for policy IIA and IIAB. You may recall that I shared that Senate Bill 656 requires that local school boards adopt policies concerning instructional materials with sexually explicit content. At this point, you have had time to hopefully review the policy revisions that were in green. If you recall, we adopted them from the VSBA, as you also may recall. I hope that you've also had an opportunity to uh, review the revised IIA regulations that explain how we will implement the revised policy. 
We stand ready to begin implementation once the policy is approved by the board. So tonight, the superintendent, as he said, recommends that the board take action on revised policy IIA and IIAB. So board members, uh, I need a motion to adopt the policy IIA and IIB. I move that we approve adoption of policy IIA and IIAB. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is adopted. Thank you. Uh, we now have our items for discussion and I will be up first with the um, collective bargaining agreement. I forgot my notebook, so I hope I remember what we did for collective bargaining. <laughs> Am I controlling this? Okay, no, I got it. Thank you. All right. So, um, members of the board, um, all those assembled, I will um, do the first reading. I will do the highlights of the collective bargaining process, um, as well as the collective bargaining resolution. And I will um, begin. Um, so just a little overview that during this presentation, I will discuss the process, um, what is identified as a bargaining unit, um, what is collective bargaining, and what does it mean, uh, what are those topics for bargaining um, and negotiation? What does the negotiation process look like? Um, the funding implications, and then lastly, um, just the review, what it means when we get to the end of the three years for the review of the resolution. Um, so really this process, as you heard Ms. Gilligan say earlier, there were a lot of meetings. This slide really doesn't do the process any justice, um, but from the board's end, they did receive the signature cards from um, the Education Association. Um, there were initial meetings um, with between the school board and the CEA reps. Um, just talk about the process and just what does this mean um, long term for um, our teachers and for the school division. Um, our school board became uh, more invested in gaining a better understanding of collective bargaining and the processes. Um, they um, did that out of order. They spent time listening to teachers just about the request and what this meant for them. There were some follow-up uh, meetings. So there were, we, um, the team, uh, began the board in collaboration with the teachers, uh, began to formulate some resolutions. Um, they began to um, pose ideas and suggestions back and forth. And then we arrive here this evening for the first reading um, of the collective bargaining resolution. And again, this six steps really does the process no justice because there were many hours that were spent on this. Um, so a bargaining unit, um, just it's a group of employees and we will talk about what those, uh, who those employees are um, on the next slide, but it's a group of employees with common or substantially similar employment duties. Um, there are some license requirements, training. And so our the team really just spent a lot of time with who are the bargaining units going to be? Um, and so here we see, we um, came up, with, we identified two bargaining units. So you have licensed personnel. And so there's some similarities in that group. Those are people who are required to hold um, licenses for their positions. And so that's inclusive of nurses, speech pathologists, teachers, um, instructional specialists. And so, um, and not an exhaustive list, I probably didn't get all of them, but you see them there. And the, um, I also wanna make sure I say that the collective bargaining resolution also is uploaded into ESP. The other group is the instructional support personnel. And those are the other, other, where, um, other groups where you don't have, they're not the licensed, but those include our instructional, um, instructional assistants, um, custodians are in that group. So um, inside the resolution, you'll see who makes up the support personnel. So the collective bargaining, what exactly is it? Um, it means to perform the mutual obligation by representatives of the school board and the exclusive representative um, to meet um, 
for reasonable times and to negotiate in good faith. And I believe that's one of the things that we heard our teachers, stakeholders, and our school boards that we wanted to continue to make sure we're acting in good faith. Bargaining topics you see listed here, wages, hours, scheduling. And I think what we really um, learned through this process is like right now we don't know what we don't know. And so there are some things that teachers um, you know, have at the top of their list. And so those things will come forward and they get to have a voice um, as it relates um, to those matters. And those things will be brought forth to our school board um, for bargaining and negotiation. And it's important to know that these topics that will be identified uh, will be for the three years, um, the first three years of the resolution. Um, so the negotiation. So the negotiation is that um, each party um, may bring up to two topics um, for a total up to uh, four. And those topics come from those, that list that I just presented. Uh, we did talk about funding implications because I know that that was like one of the overarching themes at many of our um, many of the meetings. And so um, a collective bargaining agreement is subject to sufficient appropriation from our city council. And you know, if the city council fails to um, uh, provide the funds, then we may not be able to um, implement the, uh, it, we may not be able to implement the things that are being negotiated upon. And I think one thing that I will say is that I know while that seems scary, uh, we have a very good relationship with the city. And so I, uh, I believe that they've listened to our voices. They um, have been very transparent and good partners with us. And I do anticipate that that will be the case as we work through um, collective bargaining. And then lastly, um, just a review of the resolution. And so as we approach the end of the three years, um, the school division, the school board does retain uh, the right to come back to um, this process, determine how did it work, and then in fact, um, whether this process will continue on or whether there are some uh, modifications that may need to be made. That's all of the presentation. It's, that's the abridged version of a very um, thoughtful and um, very long process. Um, but I do know that we will be better together because of this process. Any questions or comments, feedback as it relates to uh, the collective bargaining presentation or resolution? Uh, I'm just going to say uh, thank you, Dr. Gurley, for your efforts, uh, Ms. Dooley, Ms. Torres, for your efforts in getting us here, um, along with the CEA and staff um, that we have. We're just very grateful to get here. I'm uh, exceptionally happy when the General Assembly passed this resolution. I'm sorry, passed the statute that allowed for this sort of collective bargaining. So uh, this is feels like a long time coming and certainly um, one of the very few uh, jurisdictions in our state um, who has taken advantage of it. I really um, am so grateful to be on the front edge of this process. Um, and I look forward to, uh, you know, working together to um, support one another in, of course, the goal of educating all of our students. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Gurley, for being willing to uh, continue the negotiation and dialogue as this was not an easy process. And um, I know that uh, to get to this point was not always obvious. Um, and I'm so grateful that we are here. Thank you. Ms. Stooley. Hi. Nothing really substantial besides saying I learned a lot in this process. Um, I think along with the CEA um, counterparts in negotiations, um, and I think there is still a significant amount to learn as we implement this process. Um, but I'm hopeful that, um, yeah, this is really just the beginning of a really unique partnership um, that really sets us aside from uh, neighboring jurisdictions. And I hope uh, continues to make Charlottesville a really great place to uh, work. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Morsenberger, Dr. Crabb. 
Um, you know, I will just say ditto to a lot of uh, what Ms. McKeever already said in terms of gratitude um, <clears throat> and what Ms. Dooley said in terms of our learning process. And, you know, I would say none of us have really had really been here before. And, um, <clears throat> you know, while you often see us in these open meetings, we've spent a lot of time um, uh, learning in our closed sessions as well, and, and really trying to get ourselves to understand um, this process. But I think at the, at the heart of it, and I've, I've always been, you know, very, very, you know, hopeful that we could get to where we are today. Um, and I think we as the board um, have really heard the importance of our teachers and our staff feeling like you, you are valued and you are heard through having a voice in the process. And um, so I'm also very happy to be here and I've, I've learned a lot and have more to learn, uh, but thanks to everybody on the ground who put in um, all the time to get us here. Ms. Torres. Thank you. Um, yeah, not much left to say that hasn't been said, um, but as Ms. Dooley said, I, I just have a lot of gratitude um, to have had the opportunity to go through this process because it was really a lot of unknown and it was scary, but to be able to sit in, in some of the meetings with CEA and, and to be open and honest and, and sometimes there's a little energy in those meetings, but I mean, ultimately, um, I think we, from the get-go, we knew where we wanted to get. Um, and as has been alluded, there's still a lot in this process um, once this moves forward that we don't know yet, but I trust um, that the admin team, Dr. Gurley um, and, and teachers and everybody will ultimately work together and figure this all out and has been said ultimately, you know, the, the, the students um, are, are the, the end game and all of this. So I, I wanna just say thank you for um, allowing me to learn and to grow through this process. And, and again, Dr. Gurley, you know, you talk about hitting, hitting the ground running. Um, it was a lot and, and we are so grateful for you to have been through this with us. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Ms. Wall. I don't really have any questions, but I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Gurley and to the admin and the teachers and members of the board who've uh, really put in a lot for this. And I think collective bargaining is one of those things that kind of goes beyond the scope of what we as students really see. But um, I'd like to thank you because I think it's a great step um, in the way of really demonstrating support for students and teachers. That's excellent. And finally, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Gurley, for leading the way. Um, Emily, Ms. Dooley, and Ms. Torres for your outstanding work um, with the CEA and being in that room negotiating and working all the fine details out. You all did an outstanding job, and I do appreciate it. Thank you so much for your hard work into the CEA. Thank you so much for your willingness to to sit at the table and listen um, and uh, fine tune everything. And we've come to this point as a result of that. So thank you very much. All right, we will now move on to 10.2. We'll have Amanda Corman. She will give us our strategic plan update, which I am very excited about. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here to talk to you about the next steps we're taking in our strategic plan for our division 2023 to 2029. Last I spoke to you in November, we had just opened up a request for proposals to bring in a consultant to help guide us in this process as we have so much, um, so much future to plan. And so I'm glad to introduce you to the group that we will be working with, which is called Insight Education Group. We selected Insight Education Group after a competitive process. We received nine bids. And just briefly about Insight, they have extensive experience building equity-focused strategic plans in school districts um, with, in municipalities with some particularities that they share with ours, um, such as they've done strategic plans in Chapel Hill-Carborough, 
North Carolina, which is obviously a university town. They've done the strategic plans for schools in Roanoke, which is a small city in Virginia like us. And they have done the strategic plan for the school district in Ferguson, Missouri, which like us has been in the national spotlight for racist violence and has done a lot in uh, response to that to, to, do, uh, to do great work. Um, and additionally, the Insight Education Group, their consultant staff is all former teachers, school leaders, and school district administrators. And they are going to guide us through a process of stakeholder engagement, data analysis, plan creation, and implementation planning, in including crucially tools for progress monitoring, a data dashboard that'll help us into the future over the next five years of this plan. I wanna just tell you a little bit about Oh, this is uh, this is Insights strategic planning framework, which will start to make more sense to all of us as we go through this process together. But we start with the big picture, and then we drill down to the how are we going to make it happen. It's basically what all you need to know from this slide: mission, vision, and values, down to action steps. And we're going to be doing that all over the course of the next five months. The stakeholder engagement piece. I'll just briefly give you an overview of what that's going to look like. Currently, we are forming a steering committee, which is a cross section of stakeholders within the division um, and ex external to the division, um, and who will really be helping us to elevate those key ideas. So that'll be between 20 and 30 people, and we're putting that group together now, and that group will meet monthly. Our executive leadership, leader, leadership team will, of course, be a crucial part of this. Um, they will be taking what the steering committee uh, concludes and crafting the plan from that. And then most crucially, we will be engaging with our entire community through a public survey, which we will be releasing next week, as well as some focus groups of additional, um, additional groups of people whose voices will wanna make sure that we hear as we are thinking through the future. And then of course, the school board, you all, you will be uh, provided, uh, you will be providing feedback monthly on um, on what we bring to you and what these steering, what these three groups at the top are putting together. And there will be some board workshops and you will of course be um, asked to approve the plan once we have been through all that process. For the board, here are your key dates. So today we are just going over the details. So February 23rd, this meeting is already on your calendar as budget approval. I know that meeting is typically very short, uh, but it's probably going to be a half an hour less short. Uh, with your, with your um, gracious acceptance, we'll take a little bit of that time to discuss core, core, vision, core values, vision, and mission, and kind of get you up to date about the conversations that we're starting to have this month on those pieces. And then that May 18th date is um, a full plan workshop for the school board. And that is an ad, but it is an evening that was already reserved as a part of school board planning. And then we would plan to do a first reading at the June 1st meeting. And then July, obviously there's no school board meeting already planned for July. So this is really at your discretion when you'd like to um, schedule to do a final approval. I know we have sometimes in the past done a quick uh, July meeting. We could push it till August, that's, I will leave that to you, but just that's the, um, that's the landscape. And I would gladly accept questions. Ms. Torres, Ms. Wong, Dr. Craig. Uh, I don't have questions. Um, it, it's ambitious schedule <laughs> to get this done. So somebody's gonna be working hard I think that the phrase hit the ground running was used recently. Yeah, I think we're we hitting it again. Yeah. Yes. I'm excited to Me be too. doing this. Ms. Morrisonberger. I don't have any questions at this time. We're good. Mr. Morris. I just look forward to the process. Um, and thank you for giving us this update in terms of the calendar. Um, I agree it's an ambitious plan, but I think that's what we're willing to do. Ms. Tooley, Ms. McKeever, thank you. Thanks all. All right, next we will have um, Dr. Odie, 10.3. She will give us an update as it relates to um, student behavior and administrative responses. 
And there's also a, a written report that um, for the public in the um, written report section to accompany this presentation. All right, good evening once again, Mr. Chairman, board, um, board members and Dr. Gurley. Uh, now I would like to talk with you about student behavior and administrative responses. In other words, SBAR uh, data. Next slide, please. My presentation tonight will include the top five SBAR codes applied, SBAR coded incidents by ethnicity and gender, suspensions by ethnicity and gender, some additional adult responses to student behaviors, supports provided for students, and how we'll move forward. Next slide, please. In this table, you will see that BSC, or Behaviors of a Safety Concern, was coded most often. Specifically, 20 incidences, incidents, excuse me, and 16 occurrences of BSC-17, which is minor physical altercation, no injury, was coded. This, I'm so sorry, this is for this current year, from August to today. Well, not today, August to when I prepared this data this week. Yeah, first semester and into the second semester. Um, so you'll see also that 15 incidents and 24 occurrences of BSC-14 fighting no injury were recorded. Behaviors that endanger self and others appears twice here as BESO3, fighting minor injury, has 15 incidents and 21 occurrences, while BESO12, threat to staff, shows as nine incidents and nine occurrences. Behaviors related to school operations is also in the top five. BSO3, refused to comply with staff requests has 11 incidents and nine occurrences. It's important to know that incidents are the number of actual events, while occurrences include multiple students who may have been involved in the event. So for instance, one of the 20 incidents for BSC-17 could have five students involved in it. So those five students would be encompassed in the 16 occurrences. Next slide, please. Here you will see the SBAR coded incidents by ethnicity and gender. You will notice that a majority of our students, uh, excuse me, a majority of our incidents were committed by black students and male students. Next slide, please. Likewise, the suspensions by ethnicity and gender are similar. These graphs show the short-term and long-term suspensions. And you will see that short-term suspensions have been used the most, and it is mostly, again, Black students. On the right, you see that male students are suspended more than female students. Next time. We don't like these data. Um, we want to not have data like this. And so we do try to support students in a variety of ways. Is we don't prefer to suspend students. This list here displays some other responses that adults have had to student behaviors, like clarifying the expectation, having a conference with a parent, Proximity, oftentimes students will change their behavior if the teacher's standing right next to them. 
a loss of a privilege, removal of the triggers. You know, we do ABC reports, antecedents, behavior, conflict to see what caused a behavior. So we try to remove triggers if we can. We do restorative conversations to try to heal, as someone said earlier, to try to move on from whatever the issue is. We reach, reteach expectations. Sometimes it's just a break that is needed. So we absolutely try different things. We don't just resort to suspension, but unfortunately, sometimes we do need to suspend. Next slide, please. And here are some additional supports that we have provided for students. It is our goal always to be proactive so that we don't have to be reacting to behaviors and incidents as often. Focused on tiered supports. Tier one is critically important as it is intended to proactively meet students' needs through explicit instruction. Tier one mental health continues to be an area that our schools are working on, refining and getting better at with implementation and fidelity. Use of school mental health professionals, SMHPs, the school mental health professionals continue to provide tier two and tier three interventions to students as determined through VTSS teams, Virginia Tiered System of Supports. The school mental health professionals provide individualized support with specific mental health struggles, um, engagement for chronic absenteeism, grief, loss. We know that we have some grieving families right now and we support them as best as we can. Emotional regulation, as well as other specifically identified needs. They provide groups and crisis intervention. They navigate external community agencies and resources. And, and like I said before, restorative practices. That is a key to moving forward and healing and so much more. Our SMHPs are serving anywhere from 10 to 20 individual students and families each, not including the students in their groups and other crises, as well as managing other responsibilities. And you'll see more about our mental health supports in the written report that I submitted as well. We have care and safety assistance in our, in our schools, in our high school and middle school. And they're key to building relationships with students, working with, with them and, and sometimes de-escalating them as needed, um, but they're very important in our work. We just talked about how important our school counselors are just a few moments ago and the support that our students receive from them is so important to helping our students be well and to be able to really reflect on what's going on with them and to, to resolve situations in a calmer manner. As I've mentioned restorative practices often, but also we have family engagement. Um, we have home visits and uh, we're supporting administrators and staff uh, our, our school mental health professionals continue to do all of these pieces of work uh, to, help, to help our staff, to help our students to be better. We know that the connection between families and our schools, families and our SMHPs um, are key to make the needed changes for our students. And the last thing you see there, certainly not the last of what we do, but you may recall that last year we started uh, with Care Solace, and it's an agency that we have partnered with. So we provide a warm handoff, sort of, so to speak, uh, where we are connecting resources uh, for our families. We connect our families with resources outside of our schools too, because we work really hard. Our teams work so hard and we can't do it by ourselves. 
Next slide, please. So moving forward, we're gonna continue with our mental wellness supports. We know as someone spoke earlier that there are deep rooted issues that start in the community. They come into our buildings. And so we have got to work on healing. We've got to work with our families. We've got to work with the community members to solve some of these issues. Um, relationship building. Sometimes that, that's the start of it, you know, being able to have relationship, the teacher and the students, the principal and the students, uh, the CSAs, the mental health professionals, all relationships are so important. And so we continue to work there within our schools and outside of our schools. I know, for instance, I've signed up to be a mentor to, to high school students. So I wanna, I'm gonna build those relationships. And hopefully I can make it, I wanna make a difference. That's why I'm in this role. That's why I'm in education to make a difference. Partnerships with families and community members. I wish that I could say that we could solve all the problems of the world in our, within our school walls, but we cannot. And so that's why it's so important for us to be able to communicate. We have our, our wonderful family engagement uh, team. Uh, we have got to be able to connect with families, uh, churches, excuse me, churches, community members. We need to work together to ensure that our students, specifically based on these data, our black students, let's, let's say what it is, um, our black students, our, our males, and our, and our females need our support, the school, the community, all of us working together. And we wanna make sure that we provide clarity regarding expectations and accountability. I said earlier, we don't want to suspend, we don't want to remove privileges, we don't want to do all of those things, but we have to hold everyone accountable, uh, our students have to be held accountable. We have high expectations of our students, our staff, ourselves. And so we can clarify what those expectations are. We have that book, the student rights and responsibilities that every student has access to, every parent has access to. The expectations are there, our policies are there. We have to make sure that our expectations are high for everyone, and we hold ourselves accountable and our students accountable for behaviors that are not acceptable. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. I think I've covered all of those things there. Uh, at this time, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Odie. I appreciate you turning around this presentation so quickly. Um, I, I just want to clarify, this is um, a state report, right, that we submit? We do have to report data to the state. So the SBAR codes that you have here are what is reportable, reportable data, reportable incidents. I feel like this is a really good uh, snapshot of what is actually happening in our schools. So I appreciate the transparency of the data, at least um, thus far this year. I uh, it's obviously not what we want it to be and certainly look forward to um, just kind of ongoing um, dialogue and action about how to make this better for our students and our staff and our community. Um, I think it's a really been such so enlightening for the board to kind of work completely together on the um, discipline committee um, and see the real gaps there are for supporting our students and our community. Um, you know, we have to, we have really conflicting goals. Uh, we need every student to graduate that supports our community, that supports our, um, our goals. Um, and of course, it's you know, helps the student. Um, and so when we have to remove somebody from the environment, 
um, for the safety of the whole school, it is there, the, this is a conflict. And so just to see what um, is not out there to support our students, we it, it is such a hard thing to consider. Okay, well, they're going to sit at home on their, uh, you know, phone or device all day. And, and that is just not a fun thing to consider for our students. Um, and so it, it really, I think this board is just working so hard to try to find ways to, um, to kind of provide the safety net for the student who is having to be removed for the school. And I think we've done admirable work at Buford and with LMA, just with the new success uh, pathways program. So I'm just really, you know, I just want everybody to know that we're really struggling to, um, not struggling as much as just like wanting to get it right for our community um, and hopeful that like this is a part of a dialogue rather than like us telling the community this is what we want um, or the community telling us this is what we need. It's just like more of a, you know, a problem solving approach that the whole, the, everybody can come to the table with. Um, so I just really appreciate this board for their thoughtfulness um, in their approach to discipline. I think we're going to continue to see um, as we are more transparent with our numbers and if we are asking for more accountability from our students um, that we these numbers may continue to um, reflect the kind of turmoil that our um, community is in, um, but that hopefully um, we with the supports that we have in place and the ongoing dialogue that will eventually um, see some results. And I just really appreciate the comments that we've had on it, on discipline in our community. Um, I think Ms. Bryant and Mr. Grady just really are speaking, you know, their hearts and I really hear what they're saying. And um, I, I think this board is working diligently to both protect our student body and staff and to um, have accountability, but with a net to provide for those students eventually graduating. And um, because nobody, you know, every student is valued in our community. So thank you for that report. Ms. Dooley. Mr. Morris. I don't wanna to repeat too much of what Mr. McKeever said, but um, I, I greatly appreciate the work that the board has done in trying to ensure that our students have the proper channels um, when we have to take certain actions. I would also like to speak um, a little bit in regards to you know, some of the things that the school does and the foundational things that we do. Um, we are trying to address the issues at hand, but also it does take community partners because we're not the only ones within this. Um, as we work together, we also must take into account the individual responsibilities, whether that's a student, parent, um, educators, we all have a, a part to play in this. And ultimately, we want everyone to be successful, just as was mentioned. Um, and a part of that is having safe schools, um, appropriate behavior. And we want all kids to be able to work within the school system and be successful, not just for academic sake, but for a lifetime. Ms. Wong. Um, thank you for your presentation. I uh, just wanted to kind of bring up two different things. Um, uh, you mentioned a lot about accountability for students. And I think, I mean, I think that's important. And I, I do think part of that is, a, is in part of clarity is, is really making sure students are um, aware of the, the policies that, I mean, are available to students, but realistically, students aren't really aware of that. I think a bigger sign of uh, how those, the school is gonna and the uh, city is gonna handle that uh, certain types of behavior and whatnot would be uh, like actual practice in schools, which is what students are experiencing. And I think there's not enough uniform uh, like carry out to speak of these policies. And um, I think in, from my experience, and I think 
um, other students experience. There's just uh, not having uniform like enforcement um, and carry out leaves room for like dis disciplinary discrimination. And I mean, there's a, there's a lot of room for error there, I think. And I, I think there needs to be maybe more robust translation of what the policies are to actual practice. Um, and the second thing is I, I've also noticed there's a lot of um, maybe undue burden on counselors and teachers to deal with like a, a wide array of different problems because all, all students are in a different place. Um, but just ha having limited resources in that sense, I think creates, um, there's not enough uh, maybe bandwidth to deal with every student's concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Ms. Torres. I'm never not um, amazed with the wisdom of whatever student is sitting here um, with us. So I just wanna say thank you for sharing. And we've had that throughout the years. And I will look at someone else in our media center. So thank you to all students who have participated <laughs> on this board. Um, I think you, you said some really, um, again, just um, incredible things. And I think um, touching on just the student rights and responsibilities and, and um, you know, even uh, as a board and a, one of my colleagues this evening was looking at that and, <laughs> and it's really dense. And so, yes, to have an understanding and the consistency for everybody involved as far as what, what is within that student rights and responsibilities. And then a point that you made as far as the uniformity of, of the policies um, when they're violated and the consequences. So, you know, that's something that I think we have had conversations about and we as a board are, are working um, you know, behind the scenes to do. So I do want to acknowledge also Ms. Hudson, and I, I think she's um, departed, but just her concerns that she brought forward. Um, I want to acknowledge the gravity um, of the recent conflicts and the incidents that have happened here and, and within the division and the community, um, and that we do take that very seriously and, and to heart. And, and it it would be great if there was an easy answer and it's not and has been said by colleagues that you know we're looking to do as much as we can within the buildings um, please know dr Gurley and your team um, that we are here to support and you know our family engagement team is is wonderful but it's not enough i mean we could have 30 of the johnson and johnsons you know out there <laughs> um doing what they do best and, and we need more of that. But I, you know, whatever we can do to support um, the liaison, the communication, the relationships with the school division and those community people that we know we need to um, partner with and we need, we need to sit with them and, and listen to them. And again, it, it is a lot and we need our teachers to be able to teach, right? And, and um, the students to learn, every single student. So again, thank you for your comments and, and whatever we can do to support you. We're here, Dr. Gurley and team. Okay, Dr. Kraft. Yeah, this is something that um, <clears throat> I'm very concerned about. Um, and it doesn't make me feel any better to look, see what the data look like. Um, and I think we're really struggling. I think our division has put a lot of resources out there in the schools, you know, to try and help. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the questions is how do we, how do we know if what we're doing is working or not? You know, how do we figure that out? <clears throat> um, and I don't have the answer to that, but it, you know, we, you know, I think we are making a lot of efforts that, and doing things that seem like the right things to do, but I don't know how to really assess how effective these things are. Um, another comment, um, 
you know, we talk a lot about community partners and I don't actually know what's happening with community partners. Like what, what's actually going on in the community? Is there any kind of coordinated effort to deal with, you know, the, the kinds of issues that are behind the student outbursts that we see in the videos? Um, uh, what, you know, what is happening if, if it isn't a coordinated effort? You know, who's gonna, who's gonna lead that effort? Who's gonna organize um, in the community so that community partners can actually be effective? Um, you know, in addressing some of the issues that do not originate in the school building, but they come into the school building, they end up there. So that's a question I have. Um, you know, and I, you know, I just think there are some, <laughs> perhaps some, you know, other creative steps that, that we can think about or people can bring to us ideas for other out of the box steps that can maybe help us see some things that we haven't been seeing. Um, I know that uh, Zayana Bryant had a meeting, uh, organized a meeting with students, um, for students, and that, what a great idea, you know. So what, what did the students say? What did they tell us about this? We need to hear um, from some of those things. And I'd, I'd like to just see more uh, opportunities for uh, students to really come forward and, you know, tell us what their experience is and any ideas that they have for um, what we can do differently. So, um, you know, how does this all this look from the students' point of view? You know, so those are just my thoughts. I don't, I don't know that I have questions except, you know, like some of those were kind of questions, like what are, you know. What are the community partners doing? Who are they? And are they, are we doing anything beyond just saying we need their help? So um, anyway, thank you for putting all this together, Dr. Odie. Ms. Mossenberg. Um, I also uh, have the uh, privilege, I guess, of being on the discipline uh, committee. I'd never done it um, while I'm on the school board. It was just recently. And um, I just I just remember feeling just completely, just feeling torn because it, there are hard choices and hard decisions. And I guess, I guess the, the frustration is, and I'll try to make it make sense, is that if you all remember during COVID, you got to be a whole person, right? If you were working from home, it was okay. You had a kid at home because your kid is at home with you and everyone's going through the same thing. And I feel like when it comes to discipline, people should get to be whole people too. And we should take all those things into account. So when you're on the discipline committee and there's obvious trauma, there's obvious outside circumstances, it, it's hard, like I don't, I, I understand you, that there are these videos out there and it's like, well, what's happening? What's going on? We, there's a dichotomy where it's like safety, 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 discipline, discipline, discipline. And then on the other hand, when kids aren't in school and they're suspended and expelled, what happens to them then? Then, you know, in hindsight, it's 2020, like, oh, maybe this kid should have been in school. It's hard to say it feels almost like throwing someone away, especially when there's all this, you can see the whole person and they've been let down by all these other systems in the school. They're here eight hours a day or depending on the grade, but you're here and you wanna be able to help the students. And having said all that, the, the other students who come and teachers should feel safe in the building as well. So it, there are hard choices and being on that committee feels very much like being a parent where you want to do what's best for all your kids, both your kids, but you also, you, you want them to be able to function in the world when you're not there to, to say, hey, you made a mistake, let me help you. So I, I understand that, you know, there needs to be accountability and consequences, but I feel like 
when you look at that diet, you know, the chart that you showed and it's like, oh, it's young, it's men, it's young black men, it's young black boys, that a lot of the conditions of your life, if you're a young black man or a young black girl in Charlottesville, the conditions of your life are a consequence. The conditions of your life are what is, you know, that's the account of being black here in Charlottesville. And so there are problems that we would like to fix. I don't know how to fix them all, but to not factor in that violence can touch certain parts of this community and in, it, it, it doesn't make a blip, but if it happens in another part of the community or on the downtown mall, then it, it's, it, it does make a blip and things get solved and people are held to account. So I feel like we can talk about the community partners and all these people, but these things are generational and they're, they're heavy and they're deep. And I don't know, like all the answers aren't gonna be simple. And you, there might be kids fighting in the hallway and that can happen. And if they're not fighting in the hallway and they get suspended, there's gonna be something somewhere else as a result of that. And those are all things that we have to, to think about. And so I worry about kids in school. I worry about people getting hurt. I worry about teachers and staff. And I worry about those kids when they're not in school. And you know, the pendulum swings back and forth. We got rid of SROs. We went to the CSAs or yeah, the CSAs, the care assistants. But no matter which way you go, there's going to be some overflow. Like it's not, you have to deal with the problems as they come to just say there was this fight, we saw it, you know, we probably need SROs again. This, it's swinging it back and then we'll get back to, oh, now we're talking about the prison, school to prison pipeline. It's like, it's complicated, it's nuanced and it's not just a knee jerk reaction. You have to take all these factors into consideration. And so, so we're accountable to schools. There's all this, everybody needs to be accountable, but they're, they're not easy problems. And I don't think anyone has like a quick fix or an answer. And so I would just, you know, if we all here and we're all being honest and trying our best, we can get somewhere. But as a community, we have to talk about why violence only affects certain areas and it matters how you can have such a small black community in Charlottesville that continues to shrink but is disproportionately affected by violence, suspensions, and expulsions. Those are big questions that I don't know get solved just by what happens during the school during the school day. That's it. Dr. Curley. Um, thank you, Mr. Bryant, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, anybody that wants my cell phone number can have my cell phone number. Um, it's not my work phone, it's my personal cell phone number. Um, so when Miss Hudson stood up there today, she and I've had several conversations. She's texted me at 4.30 in the morning and we've had conversations at 6.30 in the morning. Um, I respect anyone who can um, bring me a problem and give me, an, and give me the solution. And I think what I heard today from her and from some others is that the high school is out of control. And I'm just here to debunk that um, because as I sit here, I see two, at least two high school teachers here. I see some care safety workers here. Um, and I know that these teachers and these staff members are working hard each and every day. And what I'm hearing and the tone is that we are not, um, we're not holding students accountable and we're not, um, we're, we're coddling students and, and that we're not being consistent when that's absolutely not true. Um, I think Ms. Morsberger, I think, you know, she, I mean, she, she stated everything that I wanted to say. These kids are me, but I'm gonna tell you that, yes, I was hired to do a job but you know, I've been loving kids in the field of education for 21 years. And I know that in this particular role, what has been asked of me is that I control what happens in the community. And I'm gonna tell you that 
I have them for eight hours a day, or if they want to do extracurricular, however many hours, I can control that the time that they're here. But if uh, the people who we're referring to as our community partners, if people, if the community isn't holding the community accountable, then what do you expect the teacher to do in the school? What do you expect us to do when the same families are fighting among one another in the community? I'm perfectly fine with educating in the community. There are a lot of models where we educate in our community. I'm fine with doing that. We beat the pavement, we're in the community. But I'm gonna tell you, until we're working collaboratively, till someone can come to me and say, say I need help. You know, I, I'm telling families all the time, tell me what you need help with. How can I help you solve the problem? But I'm gonna tell you that just as you just said, the problem is not gonna be solved in the eight hours that we're here. And if, you, and if you want to create this narrative that it's about leadership, that it's about what teachers aren't doing, then that's absolutely not true. I mean, we are, play, we are putting more black leaders in place. We, are, we, are, we did the black men meet up. We're bringing, we're bringing the faces into the schools. I mean, but if everyone is not doing the work, if we're not doing the same work at the same time, because if, if 40 organizations are gonna do 40 different things, Charlottesville is gonna to continue to fail in meeting the needs of brown and black faces because all these nonprofits doing 40 different things, they're not meeting the needs of students. We have to have continuity of services and supports within this community. And so I'm not gonna, You've, you've stolen my thunder, but I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to mince my words at all, at all, that I'm holding students accountable, that my job is every child who walks through this door deserves a free and appropriate public education, and that if children are not going to behave, if they're not going to, if, if you're not going to come in the building and if we're teaching you the skills, I had a, a parent that I, I said, I want to do some restorative things. I want, I want your child to work with the social emotional counselor. If you're going to continue to refuse services, then I've done the part that I can do. And until somebody can show me how to help someone who doesn't want to be helped, because that was the first lesson that I was learned. You can only help people who want to be helped. And so I'm never going to give up on a student. As long as you walk through the doors of the school, you're gonna receive help. And I'm not gonna to continue to put kids out arbitrarily. We have a code of conduct. Our students for the first time this school year are, know what that code of conduct means. But if you're not gonna come here and do what is expected of every student here, then I'm not gonna mince my words with this one. And whatever that means, that's what it means. But students will be held accountable. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Not to prolong, but um, I've been around in this community for as long as I can remember. <laughs> I was a part of this school system for 29 years as a teacher and counselor. And I think the data speaks for itself. I live in the 10th and Pay Street neighborhood. I lived in public housing. I know what it's like to struggle. I worked with most of the kids that I worked with during my 39 years were students who struggled, students who were not always the top in their class, but I persevered and I taught them how to respect each other and how to respect themselves. And I am very disturbed. I worked with some amazing educators over the years, amazing educators here in Charlottesville High School. Teachers come to school every day trying to do their personal best despite the obstacles sometimes that are in front of them. As the young lady said in a conference, at a VSBA conference, she said, students are going to do two things. They either are going to unpack that baggage at the door or they're going to bring it in. Yes, we want our students to graduate. I cannot tell you that the countless numbers of meetings I had as a counselor here at Charlottesville High School, how I walked these halls looking for students 
ensuring that they're going to graduate, calling those parents, inviting teachers to those senior success meetings, parents who may have had a negative experience while they were in school. And because of that connection, I was able to connect with them and said, you have to come into this building because your child is at risk of not graduating. I cannot tell you the number of times that teachers went far beyond the call of duty to ensure that those students graduated with a diploma. But it's not about graduating. I'm first gen, the first in my family to go to college. Neither one of my parents had a high school education, but they instilled the value of education in all seven of us. And what I'm saying tonight, we have got to look and hold our students accountable for their behavior. It is unfair to the other students who come to school every day and do what is asked of them. But we also want them to graduate too. It's a balancing act. It's very difficult when we're in those discipline hearings, trying to figure out how we're going to get these students to the next level. But it's gonna take a village, as the African proverb says, it takes a village to raise a child. And this is what is missing. Yes, we have those community partners who are willing to come to the table, but we have to have the parents and, and, and the guardians to come to the table as well. I, I, this, is, this is very, very upsetting to me. As a retired educator, this is what I'm seeing. We've got to hold be the, our children accountable. They cannot disrupt the education of children who are coming to school every day. Teachers are working, doing their personal best. Our administrators are working hard. The counselors are working tirelessly to ensure that our students are that, that get the services that they need, that this, the mental health counselors and the, and the school counselors. So we are doing the best we can. And for to put the narrative out that we are not, the kids are running amok and, and just running wild, no, that is not true. We have a few that are disrupting the education of others and it has to be addressed. And I wanna thank all our teachers and administrators and counselors who are, who are coming in this building every day and all over the city, doing their personal best to ensure that our children get a quality education. We have Ms. Swift with a bridging the gap update. Gaps need to be bridged. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Gurley. Uh, the Bridging the Gap Learning Loss Recovery Plan is a critical piece of the Commonwealth of Virginia's effort to restore educational e excellence to Virginia's public schools. The Department of Education wants to better understand and address learning loss and assist school divisions in this work. So the Bridging the Gap initiative will highlight some of the great programs, intervention strategies, and successes that school divisions are implementing, while also supporting more innovative applications of data-driven instruction and increasing the capacity for every school to strengthen their relationships with families. This approach will provide individualized student data report so that every kindergarten through eighth grade student, family, and teacher has all of a student's assessment information in an understandable, actionable report. This information about student proficiency and learning loss empowers these critical stakeholders to make the best decisions to ensure every child is prepared for life. It will ensure every student who is not on track has a personalized learning plan that commits to a set of actions that teachers, families, and students will take to address learning gaps. These personalized learning plans will be developed and executed in partnership with the teachers, families, and their students. It will also provide a comprehensive training to teachers on how to communicate with families and students about where a student is academically and the steps that will be taken together to get a student to grade level proficiency. So by the time students head back to school in 2023, 
Every student, family, and teacher will have access to these individualized student data reports, personalized learning plans as needed, and comprehensive teacher training. So this school year, the Virginia Department of Education will partner with school divisions to pilot the implementation of Bridging the Gap. And there are 25 partner school divisions across the Commonwealth. We are one of the 25 school divisions to partner with the VDOE on this project, and we have selected Buford Middle School for this pilot. So in order to better understand and address learning loss and assist school divisions in this work, the pilot is focused on learning what school divisions are already doing in the space of family engagement, data-driven instructional practices, and how underperforming students can be served with instructional best practices. This pilot year will provide partner school divisions with access to individualized student data reports, uh, support developing a personalized learning plan model that meets their needs, and continual training from the VDOE and its partners. We will also have the opportunity to share feedback to the VDOE on every aspect of the pilot, including the family-facing and teacher-facing training that will be in development. So participating divisions will have early access to the state's new analytics platform called VVOS, which stands for Virginia's Visualization and Analytics Solution. It will implement personalized learning plan to guide the recovery of lost learning and to support that student to be on or above grade level performance. And divisions will ensure that families have the information they need to advocate for their child's success. And so in return, school divisions will be asked to provide student data input into VIVAS, details about any forms, methods, or tools they currently use to track the interventions and support provided to underperforming students, and access to family information to share training and to collect feedback. So far, we have participated in a VDOE webinar with the other school divisions that provided an overview of this pilot project. We have discussed the goals and the components of the pilot with Dr. Gurley and division leads. We have introduced this pilot program to the Buford leadership team. We have created a personalized learning plan template for teachers to use with their students. And we have identified the teachers and students for the pilot at Buford. And so our next steps will be to attend Bridging the Gap trainings, which are now starting in March. This was recently pushed back uh, for division leads, administrators, coaches, specialists, and teachers. Uh, we will provide student data for input into VIVAS, our SOLs and MAP data. We will implement a personalized learning plan for the identified students and provide continuous support to Buford throughout the pilot process. We are extremely excited to partner with the VDOE on this journey so that we will be able to innovate in the ways that we engage with our students, their families, and together utilize the best data at improving each student's academic potential. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Any questions, Jennifer? I just, I wonder, um, again, I, I think this, obviously I've been fighting for this for I don't know, five years. Um, it feels like progress. So I'm very grateful. I do wonder about the what the state is gonna do with this data. Um, I fear that it will just use it as a hammer. Like I just have very little faith in the Virginia Department of Education at this point, especially given their actions around curriculum of late. So I'm very concerned about what they're gonna do with the data. So I think we should be on top of that, but also, I'm just wondering, it's, you said you're starting in seventh grade. It says it starts in 2022, 23 year. And I just wonder if like next year's seventh graders will benefit. Like how is this, I, I, you know, there is so much that like, I know we've been talking about um, Walker's numbers. And so mm -hmm. I just wonder like if those kids are coming up from Walker to Buford next year, like how are, is there gonna be some, are they, who's gonna be, 
under this pilot. Right. So the pilot is at Buford in seventh grade. We decided one Buford is our federally identified school. So we decided to start there and start small in seventh grade. Um, but next year, all schools in school divisions across uh, the Commonwealth will have access to these student reports, the personalized learning plans and the training. So our pilot for the 22-23 year it's, it's just for the seventh graders currently at Buford. Yes, yes. And then next year, what are we as a school division going to be doing? So next year, so this will be K through eighth grade. And so all our schools will be participating in bridging the gap. This so presumably this time next year, parents will have access to that to dashboard these reports, yes. and mm -hmm. a personalized learning. So um, the pilot really is to give us early access to the VIVAS analytics, the digital, the data visualization platform. Okay. And so we can learn more about that, start to build capacity now instead okay. of being introduced to it later down the road at the beginning of the school year. Okay, great. Well, that's very exciting. Yeah. How is it? Like, do you think it will be useful? I mean, or is it we're, just we're hoping, be another we've, thing? we've attended just a couple overview sessions right now. And so um, in March, we are bringing um, principals with us to Louisa. They're hosting an in-person VVOS training. And so we're hoping to learn more about the platform and what it has to offer. And Ms. McKeever, Ms. Um, Swift is being really nice. Um, <laughs> the DOE is moving really, we were hoping that this would have gone um, a little faster. And so they have had several delays and I mean, they were very energized and there was a lot of synergy at, at the beginning and now it's it's moving like snail mail. Um, so, I mean, we were hoping to be further along right now, so. Well, I, I'm very excited about it. And I think like to the extent that we create our own infrastructure or that would also be, I mean, I love the idea of the templates, you know, and, and, and having as much as possible that we can use from the state, but also like, we, you know, to the extent that we have templates or other um, other division-led resources for our staff, that would be helpful, and parents. And being part of the pilot too, we get to give our input into like the personalized Utility. learning plan. So we submitted our template along with the other divisions. And so we can see what other divisions are doing. So then the state will come up with a, a model. It's really exciting. I hope that it kind of, yes. like the vision of it sounds, yes really great yeah. and but i as with things that come from the state i very much worry about what the ground looks like thanks miss mm -hmm. dooley um in a follow-up can we learn more about how teachers are going to be trained um and impacts on their time reducing amount of time that's intruding upon planning and pulling them out of yes, classes as soon as and i'm curious about that as well um, right? yeah. i'm interested in that and just what the lift is going to be for teachers mm -hmm. um how is the i guess the template is just in theory right now we don't have the final version how does it compare to for example like a map assessment that gives you kind of the next steps for addressing Oh, Mr. like the learning. template compared to, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's going to pull all their data. So we're looking at SOL data, map data, and any division common wide assessments. We're also um, in our template, we added like student strengths. So those strengths that we can build upon and then areas for improvement. And then also action steps. And what are those instructional strategies that students need in order to, to meet their goals? Mm -hmm. And so they'll have a reading goal and a math goal. And then also the we want to be able to bring the families in too, because a lot of times we have these conversations and sometimes families aren't always a part of this conversation. So then they're also signing off on the plan along with the student agreeing to these goals. And this is what we're all working towards. And, you know, just kind of referencing back to Mr. Koenig's comments earlier, just in our template or whatever is ultimately adopted, you know, emphasizing not just the standardized testing right. progress that right. quite frankly is far less important to me than, um, yeah, just deeper level and, learning, and higher that bones. Is, and that's why we are, so we are including growth assessment and then also our division common assessments as well. Great. Mr. Boris. Ms. Dooley took some of my stuff, so no, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Morrison Berg. I just had a quick question because you were talking about the SOL question and um, mentioned earlier about opting out. Do we lose funding if a certain amount of kids opt out of the tests? Or do you, or um, it can be for follow-up? Well, it what it 
will um, ding us on is federal participation. Um, so that is something that we would need to talk about and consider. I don't know, Dr. Gurley. So, Mr. Co yes. Yeah, so, Mr. Koning is absolutely correct. You can um, you can opt out. Um, however, the unintended consequence for the school division is it impacts our participation rate. So when your participation rate falls below the 90%, 95%, 95%, 95%, then it it impacts the school division. So, but I definitely understand why parents make the choice. So, I mean, and it's just another battle that we keep fighting with at the state level. Dr. Kraft. Um, yeah, um, I think this is a good step and something good for us to be involved in. Um, I, I guess my one question is, um, I mean, it sounds like a lot of it is just collecting data and putting it in this template. And then um, my question is, are they then introducing different methodologies for instruction or different materials than the things that we're already doing? So with the pilot, they're looking with all the divisions that are partnering, kind of looking to see what, what are we doing now and then what's working? And then what are those strategies that then we can share with other divisions moving forward, what's working? Um, and then it's also taking the student data and putting that into the VIVAS analytics platform, this data visualization platform to help teachers and families understand their students' data better. But it's not, they're not, we're not going to be forced to adopt some different um, instructional approaches? Then? No, but I think it will be offered. Like these are some of the best, like in other divisions, these okay. are some of those instructional best practices that are working and sharing those resources. But, and teachers will have training as well. We're not, we haven't gotten to that part of the uh, pilot yet, um, but we'll, hmm. uh, we'll share more information when we get to that point. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Ms. Torres. Um, I have to say, when I, when I looked through this presentation um, earlier in the week, uh, similar to Ms. McKeever, there was something that just made me nervous about it. And I, I can't really put my finger on it. Um, I think there are a lot of unknowns, and I think that also makes me nervous. I find it intriguing, too, that there's a, a Senate bill um, right now, 1329, one of uh, Senator McClellan's bills that has to do um, with a parent data portal requiring the Board of Education to create that so mm -hmm. that that information will be available there. So I'm wondering if that's kind of that's potentially in, yes, what's that's slowing a, down mm -hmm. or if, if they're going to integrate these things. Um, I'm very supportive of, you know, us as a division looking to how we can individualize plans and supports right. for students. Um, I, I truly do question how, um, other than sharing the data with families, um, like, you know, what else are they going to do with, with, <laughs> Right, it's portal. having a conversation with them, and then what are those next steps? Yeah, like, and, I, and that just seems so far removed from right, from right. VDA. And I think, and that's really... a lot of what what my understanding is: this comprehensive training for teachers, how to best communicate with families yeah. and students. That, that's so hard. I mean, it's really easy to say. Oh, right, right, right. right. Um, but I also do have concerns, and I had written down just the the staff training and and pulling you know pulling time away from them when we really need them working right. with it. So whether or not, I mean, if this comes to fruition and it's something that everybody in the Commonwealth has to do, you know, ensuring I would hope that we have um, more use <laughs> to, to, you know, pull the data and to do some of that so it's not taking away time from right. teachers. Um, right. But again, so... Yeah, I, I just have a lot of questions yeah. about it. Yeah. And, and, and again, it, it is in the beginning stages. And like Dr. Gurley mentioned, it, it has been pushed back um, another month for because <laughs> um, they are working on the analytics system piece. So um, but of course, as we get more information and can share in another update, we will. Ms. Wong, do you have any questions? Well, thank you. Ms. Swift, any more questions? Dr. Gurley? All right, and I will um, do the budget presentation. Oh. 
All right. Um, so I am here to uh, present our um, fiscal year 2024 board. Um, good evening. I've said that earlier. All right. So the first thing I want to say is um, that much of the information that you all have seen here this evening, um, that you've seen here this evening, um, I did on January the 15th, 2023. Um, so a lot of the information is repetitive. Um, so I um, will go through it a little quickly, um, but most certainly um, I will go as fast or as slow as you need me to go. All right, and that rhymed. Um, and so we will start with, um, there is the budget guidance and priorities, enrollment, um, student experiences, and the um, proposed budget for the upcoming uh, school year. Um, so there is a requirement that the superintendent um, puts forth um, a budget each year and we make those changes as necessary and that's the process that we are going through this evening. Um, just a reminder that these are our board priorities. Um, these are the priority, budget priorities. They've not changed since our last meeting and you will see that we focus very intentionally on these throughout the, um, uh, this presentation and the budget development. This is a new slide, so I will make sure that I um, highlight this, um, that I wanna draw your attention um, that most of our money, 64% of our money is centered around academic excellence. And this is aligned to our strategic plan. Um, so I wanna make sure that um, I highlight that this was one of the slides that was new since our last, uh, since our last meeting. Um, so enrollment. Um, again, I just want to remind you that if you look in that far right um, column um, under 2022, um, what you'll see is that we are almost back at our pre-pandemic levels um, for enrollment. Um, and so we are just a little shy. We're about 70 students shy of our peak. We have a new slide here um, based on some of the work from our, um, based on some of the conversations from our work session. And so what you see here is how our students um, are enrolled by level. Um, so you see how many pre-K students we have, elementary, upper elementary. And so you see, uh, and then in the left-hand column, you see the racial makeup um, of our students. So we did add the table on the right-hand side. I do wanna make sure that I highlight because this is essential to our budget development, um, our, how our um, look on our outlook on our students who are receiving English as a second language ser um, service, services. And so I just wanna make sure that I call your attention to the numbers of students who were enrolled on um, June the 11th, 2022. And then how many students down there in the yellow box um, in the division, how many we have now, uh, which is uh, as of, I should say, as of January the 17th, and that number is 646. So we were up about, uh, we were up about 98 students. And I just wanna make sure that I also note that um, um, Dr. Jeannie Faust is projecting that over the course of next school year, we will have, um, an in we will see an increase of about 100 students. Um, we have a, another slide that was added since our last budget presentation, and this is, just shows our enrollment from fall of 2021 to the fall of 2022. And then you see that increase um, was almost um, was almost three percent. Um, there was almost a three percent increase in the students who were needing um, English as a second language services. So our student experience. Um, Dr. Odie um, talked about this at our budget work session, and you heard us talk about this in our PTO sessions, uh, the student experience. This uh, budget focuses on preserving our students' experiences. And so you, uh, what we have previously stated and what you know is that we um, have worked to uh, facilitate and engage our students in um, very um, scientific and specific reading experiences. We have afforded our students hands-on and practical experiences in the areas of history, um, history and science. And additionally, um, 
as we talk about our um, first generation students and the students um, enrolled in the AVID programs, they have been um, doing those college tours. Um, and this is a continuation of those student experiences. Um, and many of those things are reflected in um, co-curricular um, co experiences, um, as well as athletics and, um, athletics and fine arts. And I think that we have been talking this evening about, um, we've been talking this evening about student discipline and things, but we know that included in that experience is our need to support the mental health needs of our, of our students and continuing to mentor our students. Dr. Odie mentioned that she will be mentoring students. I, off, um, I um, also signed up to mentor students and I think that We've been doing those types of things. We are all hands on, we are um, all in, and I think it's vital so that our students see us, not that we are people who are sitting behind desks and we're wearing suits and we live this place that we are, uh, we are doing this work alongside them. And so the proposed budget for um, 2024, and um, what you see here, um, the under salary and benefits, uh, we talked about the 5%, the average of the 5% increase um, for, those, um, for those various groups. Uh, we talked at length um, last, we talked at length during the budget work session about correcting the, um, correcting the steps for the people who were frozen uh, during the pan, um, frozen during the pandemic. If you drop down to the non-reoccurring and discretion and non-discretionary contracts, we are still working through with our city um, as we talk about the transportation, um, the transportation contract and cost. And, um, and again, I just cannot mention enough about how we are putting, investing the money um, in our students who are receiving the English language learner services. So where those interpretation services are needed and uh, those interpretation services and those um, in the testing, I should say. Um, we did, we do have the addition of the three positions uh, and that supports how we are prioritizing our, um, our efforts here with the English language learners. Um, we did have some um, conversation about the um, graduation coach. And so I wanna um, just let you know that I did follow back up with the uh, professional school counselors here at the high school, an amazing group. Um, among the amazing groups of um, school counselors we met on the 26th. Um, they saw our work session, so they were ready when I came to the meeting. Um, they had ideas. They were ready to take action during that meeting. Um, they made it very clear. Um, I made it very clear to them that you all as a board are supportive. I think they heard that in the presentation. Um, they know you're supportive. Um, and that we are working um, to just continue to do this work and that what they heard is that if you if they felt like they needed another professional school counselor here at the high school that I was you know willing to bring that back. Um, the counselors collectively support um, a graduation coach. I didn't add one word there. I told them this is your meeting, uh, but they do feel strongly that if the right person is hired that Instead of, I think I used more of the working with the 11th, um, working with the 12th graders back, they use more of the, we really need someone to be all in to help us with the ninth graders um, because that's where we lose them. And we didn't have that conversation. And I, uh, we didn't have that conversation during the work session. So I was very appreciative that they brought a, another perspective that let's start with ninth graders because there's um, a list of students that really have that need additional supports when they come over and the graduation coach can help to facilitate that. The graduation coach can help to facilitate the success meetings. They talked about the number of meetings that, are, um, that need to be held by school counselors and that some of that work, um, a lot of that work can be done by the graduation coach. And so here I am um, conveying that to you that they are in support of that. And I didn't add one word um, to the, to that. Uh, Can I interrupt you? So I'm on board with what they want. I would love to see what are like, I want to see a job description and then the accountability piece, you know, so who are they reporting to? How do we know that it's working? Absolutely. So um, they, um, so I have not had, I know I saw it in my email today from Ms. Key. Um, I asked 
if they would provide, um, in that meeting I asked if they would provide the things that um, need the most attention um, in the department and that we would use that to create the job description. But most certainly, um, since we're adding a new position, I can bring that back to the board. Uh, I can bring that back to you all. And um, the other thing, is, um, the other um, thing is that some of you all have received emails about the athletics. We, I know we um, heard Coach Isley, uh, Mr. Isley, talk about the um, athletics program over at Buford. And so what we initially did was we, um, there was a request made from Mr. Jones, our um, student activities director. Um, there was a, a request for the addition of the $5,000. I know that some feel that that's not enough. And this conversation is not really about whether it's enough or too little. What I wanna say is that there has never been or there will never be a moment where if students have needs um, with, with regards to pro programs we're providing, so if it's athletics programs that we're providing, if there's a need that we generally make a way for those things to happen. And what we can do is that we collect historical data, we look at historical spending, and if we, what we're finding is that, you know, it requires more money to run these programs because there's this gap, then we can always come back, we can look at how we can appropriate funds differently towards those programs. Uh, but right now, I still support the $5,000 but I wanna let our students and our parents and our coaches know that, I mean, our students will, they're not, there won't be a time where our students need something because it's required of a program that they will go without. And I think one of them, the, the most recent example is when we talked about, um, you know, needing the athletics trainer for, um, for football. I mean, that was brought to our attention. We made it happen. So um, we will continue to work in good faith um, with our, all of our stakeholders and parents. Um, and, and I just wanna make sure that you all see that, um, that the addition of the um, state funds, the addition of the $2.5 million and that the um, request um, of the $4 million from the, uh, from the city. In terms of revenue, um, in terms of revenue, our, the governor's budget was revised to reflect our membership um, our ADM membership back in September. Um, therefore, we do see the increases, the increase of the $2.5 million, which I spoke about on the last slide. I know we've seen, we've, there's been a lot of talk and you've seen this in paper and on our news about the basic aid and the area that was done there. And so what I want you to know is that right now, everything is fresh. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of questions and there's still a lot of answers, um, answers needed. Um, what we know is that um, we get emails on Friday evenings. Um, so we did get an email on Friday um, from the state um, acknowledging the error um, um, that occurred with the CALC tool. And that was due to them not recognizing the whole, um, the, the hold on the grocery tax. Um, they have been teaching me a lot. Uh, the hold on the grocery, the whole harmless on the grocery tax. So there is this error and that error for us does equate to about $302,000. Um, we are not making any um, changes in our budget right now. Uh, we will, um, again, we'll make a way. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And if we need to do something in late, we will most certainly come back to the board. But right now, our finance team feels very confident that um, we can pivot if needed. Um, here, you've seen this slide. This is just our appropriation, how much money um, has been given to us by our um, city. And again, every time I get to say this, I wanna just plug that um, I personally wanna thank how appreciative and um, I'm very appreciative of how the openness that our city and the transparency that they have when they're working with us. And I think we've been open and transparent with them about our needs. And I think that continues us to support our students. And what we continue to hear is that our students have needs. They're coming with experiences and their appropriation allows us to meet the needs of our students because it is not a one size fit all. New slide, we had a request for the thermometer to come back. 
Um, and I said, why is it red in the thermometer? And I'm reminded that there is still mercury in the thermometer. You can't, <laughs> you can't drain it totally. Um, so the thermometer is drained. Um, theoretically, remember we started and the temperature was all the way up. Uh, we are no longer running the fever. Um, as long as we as long as we have the appropriation of the four million dollars, that will um, that will drain our um, that will drain the the um, thermometer, and we will be cooled. Um, and so, great news! I just want to reiterate what I just said: the uh, the four million dollars does allow us to drain the thermometer. We are no longer we don't have that fear of what happens with that um, fiscal cliff um, because of not having the funds. So again, just this allows us to support our students. And I think what the thing that we've heard most is how do we preserve the student experiences? And a lot of the student experiences about providing the social emotional workers, uh, providing our care safety assistance, um, just having the resources with our family engagement, um, working with the whole child, our fine arts, our athletics, all of this happens because of our appropriation and we're very appreciative. And um, new slide alert again, um, what you see here is that I think we've been very thoughtful. If you go all the way to the right of this slide, you see that from the fiscal year 22 to 23 to our upcoming uh, 23, 24, that we really only have a change of $46,000. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, you know, that kind of warms my heart um, because it's a very low number and it's all centered on children and, you know, supporting our staff with compensation um, and, you know, where it happens most with our teachers and their salaries. And um, there was a question about pre-K and that pre-K line is just that we are now going to track our um, expenses for pre-K differently. And so everything that happens with our preschool, with the special ed early childhood special education program and with our VPI, um, and with our VPI programs, uh, with the ESSA, we're required to track those funds. And so now there's just the special revenues for that. And What's happening next? Um, so what happens next is we have the um, joint work session with our city um, on, on the 8th. And then I will, um, I guess I can kind of say today that if we don't have any changes at the state level uh, with regards to um, our, with the budget and how funds are being allocated that we may request that we um, just cancel the 16th meeting because we will not have any new information between now and then, um, but if, unless you would like to have a meeting. Um, and I welcome any questions uh, with regards to anything. And I, I hopefully I went at a pace that was not too fast for you all. Ms. Wong, do you have any questions? Ms. Torres, Dr. Grad. Great job with Thanks. this budget. And I don't have questions. Um, I think it's a terrific budget. Ms. Morsenberger. Um, I just have one comment and question, and you've already hit on it. Absolutely. But I also want to just go back to it because um, $5,000 is a lot of money. But in the world of school budgets, I've learned in the last however long I've been on the school board that you know, there's just a lot of money in flux. And so I just want to advocate because you know, you don't know what you don't know. So I don't know about all the athletics at Buford and how that feeds into the high school, but just to be on the radar for equity, we have a plethora of programs at the high school and things that are provided. I think I learned recently that we pay for the AP test for any student who wants to take it. That's a lot of money and it's not need based. And so, you know, to keep equity on the table, I think that the students at Buford deserve that same energy poured into them for like, if they're not shirts for them for the, like it's an equity issue that, you know, they're not getting what is available 
the the scope of programs. Like, you know, we're always talking about these AP classes, who can take them, calculus one, two, three, 14, uh, but kids don't have shirts and $5,000, it's like, who's gonna be the lucky recipient? So I do wanna advocate for Buford to get resources because it seems like they are overlooked. And I'm not saying on your part, it seems historical, so. No, I appreciate that. And I want to make sure that I um, clarify, too, that it's not just 5000 That's an additional $5,000 to the program. And I, I think I saw Ms. Burns back there. Um, and I think that, again, I'm just going to echo what I hope people already know is that, um, you know, there are funds at the school level in terms of, you know, discretionary funds for the principal. And then there are these funds, which will go towards at these additional funds, which will go to athletics. And if there's something that's required um, that students need in order for the program to happen, most certainly they know they they know how to ask, and we will we will make sure that it happens. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Morris, no questions or comments. Thank you, Ms. Dooley, Ms. McKeever. Thank you so much. Again, I, I wanted to also echo um, the comments related to the $5,000. I know, um, you know, Mr. Isley, like he doesn't come to school board meetings, like he's been involved in athletics for so long and um, teaching in our school division. And uh, I just like, one of the things I do think that required for programs to happen is like, you know, good language, but at the same time, like, I think at the high school, people get their warm up things and they get the thing, you know, and it's like, okay, Mr. Grady wants like some warm up t shirts or whatever. I, um, I think also we have a lot of coaches who are not teachers, so they don't actually know how to access those resources in ways that maybe uh, in school staff would. Um, so just kind of, I, again, I, I would like to see a robust athletic programs at, at at, at Buford, and um, certainly they have been uh, shortchanged over the past decade. Um, but I love that energy there, and so to the support that I I welcome their advocacy and the support that we could provide for them. So thanks. And as a Miss McKeever, and as a follow up for myself, that um, I'll I will make sure that I work with Mr. Jones and um, and Mr. Andy Jones that also as a part of working with whoever the DSA will be for, um, for Buford, that those employees that are not, we've talked about the standard for, um, you know, like the coaching handbook and the, so just making sure that everybody that's a coach, whether you're internal or external, you understand the processes. And we also can use this as the evaluation period because it's looking different. The leadership is different now. And so yes, points well taken. Well, thank you, Dr. Gurley. Have you concluded your presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. This great budget. Our next item on the agenda is for response to written reports, and those reports have been duly noted. So we now will have comments from members of the community. So if you are in the, order, in the media center, please come forth. Give us your name and address. Hi, good evening. Hi, I am Amanda Burns, Dr. Gurley, Mr. Chair, school board members and community. I am the biological mother to Christopher Early, a football player and eighth grade student at Buford Middle School. But I also had the honor of being the Buford football team mom this past season. I had AJ, I had Damian, I had Eli, I had Mr. Scott, I had Mari, I had Liam, Mustafa, Brody, Raymond, Rocky, Torian, Will, Man, Zaire, Curtis, Devin, Dion, Demir, Chetty, Bright Keys, Hassan, Holden, India, Jamari, Jason, Kyle, Mr. Rat, Nasir, Mr. Dibble, SJ, Surreal, Ramir, Gabe, Ja, Makai, and Deuce. Under the direction of our head coach, Mr. Bart Isley, Coach Byers, Coach Hollywood, and Coach Shiflett. 
I'm here today in support of the school budget request in the amount of $5,000 that was requested by Mr. Jones, titled the Middle School Athletic Support and Supplies. Our students and athletes at Buford Middle School football team deserve better. I'm so thankful for Dr. Gurley's participation and conversations with me over the last year as their mom. And I can't thank you enough for that and for publicly stating your position. The uniforms that our children have are hand-me-downs from CHS. They are not branded Buford. There are no Buford colors. The helmets are hand-me-downs from CHS. Some have CHS branding, some have nothing, but there's no Buford branding. The field at Buford that we use for practice was never marked, was never maintained, except once it was aerated during the middle of the season that we had to disrupt practice for. They competed in four of eight scheduled games and traveled once to a school in Richmond for a scrimmage that was rained out. We had to cancel the first game because we didn't have enough equipment for everyone and not enough practice time for those who didn't have equipment because we had a coaching change. They didn't win a single game. There were a lot of tears, but there are a lot of smiles and laughs, a lot of heavy feelings and a lot of emotions, but also a lot of gratitude and thanks. There are a lot of Band-Aids and turf spray and tape and ice, few trips to urgent care. But also, there was a lot of dancing and singing and cheering. And did I mention laughing? They laugh a lot. And as a community, we rallied around our student athletes to purchase cleats. We picked up old pads and equipment from a storage locker here at the high school. We dug through donated pants from the closing of downtown athletics. Some students ended up providing their own pants as we were not able to outfit everyone in the sizes we needed. Coach Bart used his connections to get a water cooler, water bottles, and Gatorade for game day. Loaves and fishes, generous community members and families provided drinks and snacks for every practice, every game, for every player. That's 17 practices, five game days, times 38 students. Raising Canes, Plenty Seville, the Knox family, the Thomas family, the Schiff family, and my family all provided game day meals. That's four games, one scrimmage, times 38 students. Despite the odds, the lack of equity and funding from the district, our young men and women persevered. They learned the value of showing up after a tough loss, the value of hard work and practice. They knew they would be fed and heard, but also disciplined. They knew what was expected of them. And when those expectations were not met, they were given grace to apologize and to try again. They learned how to be a team, how to support one another, how to self-regulate and how to communicate in a way that honors who they really are, not who they thought they had to be. I'm asking that the school board request be supported and to the city at large to make a statement that Buford athletics, Buford football matters and that those 38 kids matter and the community that supports them matter and for the students that follow. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Okay, Zayana Bryant, Charlottesville resident. Um, so I won't be poetic. I don't have anything really flowery to say, but I do wanna follow up on a couple of points from the presentation about student behavior and administrative response. Um, I have a deep respect for our professionals who do work in the district, um, but I do wanna say, as Dr. Gurley said, he's not gonna mince his words, I'm not gonna mince mine either. Um, an issue is that everyone wants to talk about responsibility, who's responsible, but 
what are the calls to action, right? Like we can pass the buck all day. Oh, community's not doing enough. Teachers aren't doing enough. What are the practical asks from the district? And what are the asks from the community? And how do we meet in the middle? If there's no answers, then it's just blame game back and forth. And we've been doing this for years and I'm sure Ms. McKeever can agree to that because been on the board for a while. Um, Dr. Kraft can agree to that. Like we've had these same conversations and CHS hasn't never like not had fights. They've been fighting since my mom was in school. So that's, it's not new, but the issue is there aren't any practical um, conversations I feel that are asking for direct asks. And I think it was perfect how the coaches came and asked for $5,000. We have more than enough billionaires and millionaires in this community. $5,000 is really a drop in the bucket, not just from your budget, but from the community. So if people need to fundraise, then that's a conversation we can have. Another point that I have is that as we continue to hear the language of community partners and rapid response, I'm not really seeing it much. Um, I had a conversation with Ms. Johnson recently about how um, people from UVA can show up to support our students. And she mentioned that there would be a volunteer training that information needs to be publicized. There are parents who are constantly on Facebook talking about how they wanna support students and how they wanna come into the building. Do they know the protocol on how to do that? What can parents actually do? My mom would be more than happy to come, right? But the more we continue to say, people aren't showing up, people aren't showing up, well, probably because they don't know how to. So how do we put out a guide or a handbook as to how community people can show up? That's what I'm interested in, right? Okay, then Dr. Kraft and Ms. Larson Torres got to the crux of the issue. Um, community partners, stakeholders, um, but also the deeper systemic issues that exist. I don't think anyone's asking for the school board to fix the age old issues of our community. I think what we're asking for is accountability in terms of new policies, um, a kind of grading measure of how we're doing with these new policies and asking for the school board to take a firm stance um, on what the, what the district represents. Um, so I think Ms. Morseberger's point about viewing students as whole people um, is important and addressing the issue of disposability, right? We can say we're going to hold students accountable all day, but do you hold your accountable, do you hold your adults in the building accountable? Because if the answer is no, then where's the balance, right? Um, again, these are age old issues. CHS has had fights when I was in high school and before, but the disconnect is when parents come to the building and feel as if they're not being heard and they don't have access to certain individuals to be able to speak to them. That is an issue that should be heard, right? Now, I understand that everybody is passionate about the work they do, but at the end of the day, this is a professional space. We need to remove the feelings and get to the work. And I'm happy to partner with whoever wants to partner. I'm happy to do whatever I can. I held a healing space, as Dr. Kraft mentioned this past weekend, as a rapid response space for students to talk. We had practitioners, student leaders, um, we had students and we had adults come out and talk and share like what they want those solutions to be. And I'm happy to convene more of those spaces. I met with Jessica Carter today from her sports. Like, let's keep doing the work. But the blaming back and forth, the calling out, the cattiness, the pettiness, and just the all around attitudes from people in the community and people from the district is not going to help. Thank you. Hi, Jen Horn. Um, I'm not going to be nearly as articulate as I want to be because I'm hungry. I, I didn't mm -hmm. plan well. Um, but I'm going to try because I think there is an action item. And it's, gosh, it's been in so many stories and so many things people have talked about. We need to, <laughs> we need to get phones out of the school. And that is a harder ask than collective bargaining. I am, I am unpopular right now, but I've been teaching for 20 years and the phones are a poison. Mr. Bryant, you talked about students being able to unpack. A student cannot unpack their trauma when it follows them in their pocket. The mental health poison of students' phones is ubiquitous and it reaches every student in every class. I cannot express enough how hard Mr. Pitt works to set daily expectations for phones, how hard teachers work, but like, um, thank you so much. 
Bandwidth is a thing. And, and teachers and administrators are no match, are no match for that phone. It does not help education. We have laptops. So the argument that they need communication and connection with the outside world is, is moot. They have that. There is no need. We could put phones in, we could put special connection zones in schools, but I cannot express enough. Um, the filming, a, a kid who gets in a fight or makes a mistake. You know, when I, when I made mistakes in high school, like, haha, it was a bad scene for a week, but then it was gone. Not so for our students. Those fights follow them and they follow them to Albemarle and Monticello and Western, to the news. I, I'm gonna come to every single board meeting, every single board meeting, and I'm gonna stand up and say, we need a no phone policy at the high school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Hi, I'm Andy Jocelyn. I teach English here at Chaucer High School um, and then teach the nighttime review newspaper class. I definitely wasn't prepared to talk today. I'm wearing my Doofy Bird shirt. I, I would not have worn that. Um, but I just want to echo what Ms. Horn just said. Um, both of us worked tirelessly with teachers um, to come up with expectations here in the school around cell phones and tried to come up with a plan that kind of worked with what students wanted and what teachers wanted, administrators wanted. Um, it's not working. Um, we, we cannot um, uh, work around the most addictive device that's ever been created by human beings. Um, and it's, it's stealing the joy out of the classroom um, in a myriad ways uh, from what's happening with fight filming to um, the mesmerizing, mesmerizing gaze of TikTok. I, I can't fight it. I cannot be more interesting. I cannot make more relevant content for my classes than what they are accessing on their phones. Um, so we need to have something that happens around that. Um, and I also just wanted to comment briefly on um, the conversation around discipline and having conversations with students around the school. I wanna make sure that one thing's not lost in the statistics around black and brown students being involved in these fights the vast majority of black and brown students are not involved in fights, the vast majority. And they deserve to go to a school that is safe. They need to be able to go to the bathroom and know that they can go to the bathroom and not be harassed or walk into a cloud of vape smoke. We have to do something about this. And I really appreciate Dr. Gurley, you saying what you said, Mr. Pitt, what you've said in videos here for the school. We have to take this seriously, and I really appreciate the effort of leaders to do so. So thank you. Thank you. Is anyone? Hi, I'm Becca Saxon. I'm a parent of a senior at Charlottesville High School this year, and um, we are on Verizon. So today, our entire family lost our cell phones and got to experience what, in a way, for the day really is like. And um, while it was difficult and disconcerting and very weird. Um, it was also kind of liberating and it was wonderful. And um, I came by the school at one in around lunchtime because my son had left something in the car and I had no way to text him to say, come down and get it. And so somebody actually had to go find him. And that meant that his case manager had an opportunity to check in with him today that he wouldn't have had otherwise. And um, I'll also say that um, it was the adults in the building who <laughs> also seemed very uncomfortable to not have access to their phones. Uh, when this policy uh, was talked about in the summer, I said, what's gonna have to happen if it's ever gonna happen is that every single person who goes into the building has to put their phone away. That means when you're in a school building, Dr. Gurley's phone is away, school board members' phones are away, parents' phones are away. Everybody has to show that they have respect for what is going on in that building and for the relationships that are getting built in that building and the learning that's happening. And those phones, it, I mean, it's a major mental shift, but it is absolutely true that kids have been kids since the dawn of time. Kids have been fighting since the dawn of time. I taught at Buford in the 90s and early 2000s. Like none of what's happening is new except the intensity of it 
is exacerbated because of these phones. And I have a phone addicted child in my own home as uh, Ms. Horn will happily attest to, and he's probably one of the biggest problems with his phone, but it would his entire high school career and middle school career for that matter would have been very different had there been stricter phone policies. So I really agree. Um, I was a little skeptical, but I completely agree at this point. We have to figure out something to do about those phones. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? Mr. Como, do we have anyone with a hand raised? Thank you all for coming forth and speaking this, this evening. We will now have comments uh, from the board. And I will start with Ms. Young. Um, so thank you. I think a lot of what I've been hearing in this meeting is just, it's kind of remind me, reminded me about, um, I mean, at the crux of it is students and administrators and teachers want basically two things to feel safe and feel respected at school. And um, I think it's very possible, it's very easy to get lost in the back and forth and the technicalities of, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? And um, just, I guess, as we move forward into figuring out action, just I'm um, being reminded about that, so. Ms. Torres. Dr. Crabb. Um, I feel like th this meeting has been very important and I'd like to thank all the people who uh, came and spoke in public comment. And um, I think important topics came up. Um, you know, we, <clears throat> we have work to do. Um, talk about bridging the gaps. We have, there are a lot of gaps, a lot of kinds of gaps that need to be bridged. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, I do feel like uh, at least these things are being said and, and brought up and brought to us so that we can work on them. Um, what about doing a little pilot um, about the phones at, at the high school, trying a pilot project? Um, I was recently, oh, I listened to this podcast called The Hidden Brain. Some of you may know it. And they had some really, a couple of really good episodes on persuasion. And, <clears throat> you know, what are some of the things that you can do to actually persuade people to do what you want them to do. So maybe we could, you know, put some heads together from some of our teachers and, and our staff, think about how we could begin to introduce this idea regarding the phones and, and try something creative and try something new. So basically that's it. Um, thanks everybody for, for showing up and for speaking. It really means a lot. Ms. Morsenberger. Uh, I just wanted to say two things. Um, the first um, is to Ms. Bryant, thank you for your comments. And I wanna say what I think that the ask is, is that there almost needs to be an intake person to find out what all the needs are and then match it up with all like, and then on the other side have the people who are like, this is what I bring to the table and how I can help. Kind of like how people do campaigns. And that's kind of what's missing. Like some of the things you don't hear about until the person comes to the board or there's email, there's just, and it's not an excuse. There's just, you don't know what you don't know, but that's the ask. I think that the division and, you know, the city kind of like, we need someone to match people up and to match up resources because right now it is kind of haphazard. Um, but that's what I think is needed most. And, um, I appreciate everybody's comments. And I just want to thank Dr. Gurley. Um, I just appreciate you. I know like, I feel like things come at you hard and fast and the, um, the division, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of things going on and I feel like you rise to the occasion. 
very gracefully and kindly. And um, I always say I work in HR. I do, I work in HR <laughs> and I've had lots of bosses. I deal with managers all the time. And what makes a good manager, a good leader is just you treating people like people and being open to solving problems and not thinking you have all the answers. And I feel like you are a good leader and you're graceful and you're kind. And I feel like we are lucky to have you here. And so I just wanna thank you because you, you pour in a lot. And I don't know if you know that you are appreciated. Yes. Ms. Morris, Ms. Dooley. Thank you. Um, I think primarily I'm just grateful to be in this space where I can hear so many different perspectives. Um, I'm trying to do, just trying to listen. Um, I'm very interested in um, the idea of revising our phone policy, hearing from teachers and parents. Um, Ms. Bryant, if you were to organize um, a group of students to talk about that specifically, I'm very interested in hearing um, feedback from students as well. Um, pilots serve a purpose, uh, but in this instance, I think if we were to make such a drastic change and firm stance on phones, we have to go all in and be, you know, kind of lockstep in um, what our approach is. Um, and, you know, all of this just ties together, right? So when we're thinking about how much we struggle with our discipline decisions, if we go, you know, no phones, that's going to come back to conversations about what do we do with students who don't buy in and with parents who support their students and not buying in. Um, and so I'm very interested in this conversation. I appreciate a substantive um, solution and attempt at tackling a problem. Um, I am addicted to my phone as well. I could very much uh, <laughs> would be served well by not having my phone on me all the time. Um, so again, just I appreciate um, people's willingness to problem solve and engage in these challenging conversations. Ms. McKeever. Thank you so much. I'm just um, really grateful that, um, you know, you can just tell by the people who make comments like how supportive our community is um, of our students. So I'm just so grateful, especially like Ms. Burns, uh, Ms. Bryant for your continued engagement. Um, it's just, does, it means so much to see you here knowing how busy you are. So thank you um, for taking the time and being here. And um, it means a lot to me that you are here and continue to engage. Um, so thank you. Um, and Ms. Horn and Mr. Jocelyn, my children's favorite teacher. So thank you so much for you saying something. And, um, and I, I do think that uh, you guys have spurred us to consider what we should be doing next. And um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keevan, board members. Um, I wanna thank everyone who came forth tonight to speak to the board. It was a lively um, discussion tonight and um, it was a learning experience for all of us tonight. Um, teachers, I hear you. I was in your place once upon a time. You know, are you gonna to listen to me or are you gonna be on your phone while I was doing a counseling session? So I remember those days. So that may be something we may need to look at and study. Um, Ziana, hopefully you'll lead the charge to, to engage in some type of discussion with our students and teachers, and it may, may have to do a pilot. How do we, um, and we all are addicted, you know, I'm not as addicted, but, you know, but I can be, but there, I know when to use my phone at appropriate times. So that may be something we need to look at. And Dr. Gurley, you are certainly, I mean, you've been hitting the ground running since we hired you in October of last year. I don't think you've had a, a moment of grace, but um, as um, the expression, grace under fire, you, uh, you've stepped up to the plate and you've accepted the challenge and you have an amazing team that works with you, um, that supports you. We all support you, we all love you. And we want the community to know that um, we're doing our very best to ensure that um, our students are doing what they need to do to get the, the education that, that they need to get so they can move forth in our society and be productive citizens and teachers you are amazing, um, um, and our administrators and Mr. Pitt, um, and all the administrators in the elementary and middle school. So we 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 value you. We are blessed to have you to be a part of this school system. 
So having said that, I think um, I will move with Dr. Gurley for superintendent remarks. Um, I just want to say that I, I, I agree with it. everything being said. I am so um, blessed is the word that I would use if I were at home. I'm blessed for the voices who came to speak, whether it be about um, collective bargaining um, or the matters relating to what's happening in the schools. Um, I think Ms. Bryan is showing us um, what the exemplar um, for just the whole black excellence is. I mean, you just are doing it. And I think that we need to continue to elevate that and people need to continue to see that. Um, I'm fortunate for every single student. Um, there's not, these students are not numbers. Our students are not numbers. Um, there's a story behind each one of them. And, um, you know, and, and we won't, we won't rest until it's better. And, and the team has heard me say that, you know, really what I want to leave here, and it's a long time from now, but what I want to leave is leave the community better um, because then ultimately the school is better. And I think Ms. Horn and Mr. Jocelyn would say that we are in a pilot right now. <laughs> um, the, the current no phone policy is not working. And it's about what we heard earlier. It's about are we being consistent with the implementation? So the current pilot is not working and we have to figure out a way to make it work. Um, and I'm committed to it. Um, and I'm committed to the pushback and the whatever it takes because ultimately it's about our students just being successful. Um, and I won't take any more time. Um, everyone here in, in, Charlottesville, in Charlottesville City Schools is, is loved um, and I hope that they feel that. Thank you, Dr. Gurley. Ms. Swift will give us a wrap up. A couple of requests. So um, more information regarding the community partnerships um, and then the bridging the gap teacher training, just an update when we get that information and then um, a job description for the graduation coach. Okay, okay thank you. So before we adjourn, I would like to announce some upcoming meetings on February the 8th. The Charlottesville School Board and the City Council will have a budget work session at five o'clock at uh, KTEC on February 16th. There will be another budget work session for the, for the school board here at Charlottesville High School at five o'clock. February 23rd, the Charles City School Board budget approval meeting will be at five o'clock here at CHS. And on March 2nd, we will have our monthly school board meeting at five o'clock. So are there any comments, questions? So without further ado, this meeting stands adjourned. Mm -hmm. It's not even the longest meeting, but it